Thank you, Pete. Sorry. Yes, that's one thing, everybody. Please remember that if you'd like to speak, turn on your mic. Mayor, you, and um, we're going to open the meeting of the Tourist Development Council this morning. We have a lot to go through, so um, Stacy, would you like to call the roll, please? Chuck Prather, The Birchwood, St. Petersburg. Dave Gaddis, Mayor Bel Air Beach, and representative of the Big C. Good morning, Mike Williams, Innisbrook Resort. Michael Zoss, County Attorney's Office. Brian Lowack, President and CEO, Interim President and CEO, Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Russ Kimball, Shirt and Sand Key, Clearwater Beach. Brian Ox, Mayor Clearwater. Good morning, Doreen Moore, TRS Travel Resort Services, Vacation Rentals. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, there's just a couple of comments that I would like to make this morning about things that I've been having conversations with various and sundry people about, and I haven't brought it up here because it wasn't fully ripened yet. But there are a few um, opportunities that we may have and you may remember that um, Bill Henderson, I believe, is the person that made the motion to take some dollars from our bed tax and use it for beach renourishment. However, in giving that some additional thought, it occurs to me that if we were to operate, not necessarily change the governance model of the TDC, but operate with some of those best practice principles in mind. Because as I've been going around and talking to the various folks that are involved in this industry that reside throughout the Tampa Bay region, I've learned that the best practice nationwide is going towards the uh, private government model, such as they have in Tampa and such as they have over in Kissimmee. In talking with county administration, I've learned that many of the reasons why we might want to consider doing that, we can pretty much accomplish on our own, given we tweak a few things. And one of them would be um, the way in which we structure our board. So I look forward to having additional conversations with you. I know I've chatted a little bit with Brian about it. And I've talked to a lot of folks that are, are actually running destination markets in other parts of our state. So stay tuned, because the last six months of this year could prove to be very interesting for us and free up a lot of dollars that we could potentially use for beach renourishment and uh, get a bigger bang for the buck. On top of that, I want you all to know that right now, as we speak, we are already moving forward to renourish the most critical of our beaches right now, because I think we all can agree. Good morning. I'm so happy that you've chosen to join us. And let the record reflect, Stacy, that Commissioner Smith is here. Thank you. Um, what, where did I leave off? Yeah, moving forward as it relates to re renourishing the beach. So we do have the money. We're going to spend it wisely. And what? Which project are, is the county moving forward on that you were? Do you know the answer to that, Kevin? Which which part of our beaches are we moving forward right now first? Do you know? I'll, I'll I don't let know. you know. We Public Works is moving forward with the design of the Sand Key project. Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. I'm afraid I don't know the exact name of the beaches that are on that, but there's two beaches down to the south and the Sand Key project that are all in design and permitting right now so that when we're ready, we can move forward immediately. Great, and we'll bring you updates and continue to update you throughout the month as we move forward. Any other questions on that? That's the end of my comments for today. 
And if we could move to item three, approval of the TDC minutes, please. I need a motion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. And all in favor, please designate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Do we have any public comments, Stacy? No? All right. Katie, are you here? I didn't see you. There you are, way in the back. Come on up, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, yes, good morning. I'm excited to uh, bring up Carmen Boyce with BVK today. Um, we've had uh, several meetings. Um, we met back in May with all of our agencies, and we met by last month to really talk through our strategy uh, for FY24 planning, um, looking again at our audience, our markets, and really determining you know, how we're going to build that plan. So I'd love to introduce Carmen for her to present um, this marketing strategy for next year. Thank you. Carmen? Good morning. Good morning. This is going to throw me off. I'm used to seeing you over here, Mr. Prather, and Mr. Williams, you here. So, <laughs> good morning. Uh, so, I'm going to take you through quite a bit of information this morning. Um, and I know it's, you know, first thing starting off with a marketing strategy and plan. But um, our timing that we're looking at here is that we're, today I'm going to share with you the strategy that we've developed. Um, get your feedback, look at our, um, our objectives and so forth. Next month, we're looking at presenting um, this to the BCC, I believe, Brian, if I've gotten this correct. I know we've talked about maybe some shifts. And then in October, looking at presenting the full plan and starting to launch some of our elements. Today, I'm going to take you through everything from our objectives and strategies through to our timing, our markets, how we've analyzed this, the data that we've used, um, and get down to um, even a little bit on international. So our objectives, most of these are staying the same year over year. We know that our main objective, number one, first and foremost, is to put heads in beds. So we want to do this as efficiently as we can, and we want to drive the best ROI back to um, the county. We also know that it's important for us to differentiate ourselves, so we want to position ourselves as a premier destination. We know that arts and culture are a key piece that we want to continue to elevate through all of our messaging. We want to promote ourselves amongst um, diverse audiences. We want to be inclusive and welcoming, so that will be throughout all of our marketing. We also want to position ourselves as an organization throughout the community, both to our residents and partners, and get a lot of great dialogue amongst everyone as we look to, to work together to promote tourism to our, to our county. We also want to be responsible with sustainability. And of course, we want to be the storyteller of our destination. Our strategies to get there, um, first, we want to look at all the data that we can to help us drive decisions. We want to look at opportunities that, again, are going to give us that, that best ROI. We're going to look at awareness. We want to drive intent, and we want to do that as efficiently as we can. We want to optimize our brand platform. We don't just, just roll it out and then stick with it. We continue to always optimize based on audience, our markets, our tactics, everything that we're doing, the media, that we're, the, the different channels that we're going into. And we want to create integrated campaigns that basically push people through the funnel. We'll talk a little bit about that. We want to identify new opportunities so that we can really stand out. We're going to see a lot of, um, as we go through, we always look at a lot of the tried and true tactics. They work. We know they work. All the data that we have shows that they work. But we also want to look at opportunities to stand out. We want our consumers to be able to see us in these unique, engaging ways. So we look for those opportunities. We know that it's important for us to fulfill our need periods. We want to do that, but we know that we are a four season destination, so we want to be in market as far as our budget will allow. Um, we want to, um, again, foster collaboration amongst our partners, and, um, and we want to continue to, and Craig's going to talk a little bit about today, how we work with our community and message to our residents the value that we bring. So I'm sure most of you have seen you know, a marketing funnel. I think it's important just to kind of identify there are four stages when it comes to, or really there's five stages. We're going to focus on three when it comes to travel planning. The first is dreaming. The second is planning. And the third is booking. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have the right tactics and the right messaging at the right place in the funnel. 
we always know that, you know, there are certain, it's, it's great we can look at results when it comes down to people clicking on banners and looking at search, and those are critical for when we get down to, to block, when we, we know that people are going to be booking and planning, uh, we want to be in front of them, but it's also equally important to be visually in front of them and telling that story upper funnel when they're not as familiar with us. It's very important also as we look at integration. Uh, we field a study with destination analysts every year, and it looks at the performance of our campaigns. Um, we've got quite a few little, little graphs here, but basically what this is telling us is that integration works. If you look at the bottom left here, you'll see that if you go into one channel, the results are much lower than if you're into five different channels. So when we're trying to look at drawing intent, we want people to really consider us, it works very well the more channels that we can be in. The way I think about it is, you know, people throughout the day, they get up in the morning, they may check their phone, they may look at Facebook, they may get in the car and listen to you know, WFLA as they drive to work, but when they're at work, they may listen to streaming music. When they get home, they may be appointment-driven and, and watching the, a specific show on television, whether it's streaming or broadcast, but we know that they are truly consuming a lot of different media through the day, so we want to make sure that we're surrounding them with our messaging. So we looked at our audience this year. It's been a couple of years since we've really looked at our audience. Um, we have a tool called Helixa, and it allows us to go in and look at our audience, look at um, the breakdown demographic, psychogra psychographically. It looks at their values, the things that they like to do, their priorities, what motivates them. It also even shows us influencers and brands that they're affiliated with or that they align with. So this is great when we look at our messaging because we want to know what are the things that we really want to call out to, these, to this audience? How do we want to target our media? And where do we want to be? We know if they're, you know, in their, when they're in specific placements and specific media that they're looking at, we want to be there. Um, the interesting piece that we're seeing with, the, with our audience as we look at it this year is that we're seeing a more even split between men and women. And you'll see for the first time we've actually got a, a, an image of a, of a man up there. Um, men are skewing just ever so slightly more coming into the destination than women. But it's a pretty even split, so that's important as we look at our targeting. But we also know one key, key thing, more women do the planning than men when it comes to travel planning. So our message is important to be in front of men. We know that it's important for them to be inspired and want to be here, but we know it's also equally important to be in, in front of women. So you'll see that we'll be really targeting um, both of these audiences. We'll be looking at adults 25 to 54. We know that they're affluent. We know that they're educated. We're going to focus on the areas where we get most of our visitation, which is east of the Mississippi. And also we're going to focus on audiences that we know align with our brand, with our core human value of vibrancy. So we also look at our, at our, at our targeting based on segments. We dig down a little bit deeper. These four segments are a little bit different than the ones that we've had before, but just barely, uh, barely so. But these four are ones, again, that we can go into the market and we know that if we want to buy specific publications or programming, we can talk to this audience. We go down and we look at the very bottom, if you can see here, we've also started calling out different um, activities that they would, these audiences would be looking to do once they're in market. And this is great when we go to our creative teams and we go to our media teams to plan the media, they can really look at this as a referral document to know what kind of things do we want to talk to these segments and where might they be. Um, diversity, we talked about diversity and inclusion. We also want to look at those audiences. So we have looked at these three audiences that are very important to us to further understand um, motivations, um, their values, and again, the things that we may want to call out as we look at messaging to these audiences. Seasonality, you know the seasonality. Um, our need periods really do range from early fall, late summer, through to uh, Q1. Uh, a calendar year, Q1. Um, destination Analyst has been able to provide us information that shows that um, the time frame from when somebody's in market, when they've, when the, the, the decision to be in market is 90 days. So we want to be in front of people as far out as possible when we're messaging, messaging to them for these particular time frames. But there are also other considerations when we look at seasonal recommendations. First, Let's make sure that we are out there as far in advance as we can when we're, talk to, when we're talking to um, people, especially for that upper funnel. 
and when they're looking at that um, dreaming and awareness phase, we want to be in front of them 90 days out in, uh, in front of them as far as if we can. The other pieces we want to look at, um, uh, when it's cold, it's great to have this juxtaposition of our nice, warm, you know, lovely destination when it's cold and gray up north. So, uh, so we want to make sure that we take advantage of that. We also, we may look at the calendar and say, wow, based on all these timings, it'd be great to be in market for a certain time frame, but we know that it, it's highly cluttered, like around the holidays. And we don't want to be uh, in market during those times because we can't be as impactful. But we also, and last here, we want to make sure that we do have some level of coverage, even if it's light, throughout the year to cover as far as our budgets will allow. So markets. How do we look at our markets? Let me take a sip of water real quick. So when we look at our, mar our, our market, we use a market model that is proprietary to BVK, um, and it really helps us identify markets of opportunity. Uh, we know that we want to look at markets that will give us the best ROI. So there are a number of factors that we look at um, across the board that, that look at intent, that look at opportunity. And we have a lot of different data that shows us what, what drives those particular pieces. Fortunately, we have a lot of data available to us, um, both that uh, Visit St. Pete Clearwater subscribes to and BVK. Um, we can look at information like through Zartico. Zartico gives us a lot of information about people with their cell phones being in market. We, we have an idea of how much they're spending when they're in market, um, which is great. We know some markets tend to spend more than others and stay longer than others. That's important information for us because it really drives economic impact. We can look at the visitation volume from Zartico. Again, great thing for us to look at when we look at the opportunity of driving the most visitors that we can. When we look at information like through MRI and we look at Squad, uh, Squad is telling us what our media costs are to be um, in a particular market. And this is like my number one favorite data point because it may be great to be in a market, great opportunity, seems wonderful, and it may cost us a fortune. And we've seen many times we can sometimes be in two markets for less than being in one market and drive more volume out of those two smaller markets. So that's something that we really look at as we look, at th uh, look through all this data. Um, we also look at um, key data. That's another piece that's important for us. We want to look at triggers for intent. So we look at, uh, have they gone to our website? Are they seeking information? Are they interested, um, through MRI, we can tell people that are interested in coming to Florida or people that are interested in coming to beaches. So we take all this together and it gives us a direction of markets that we may want to consider that really will de deliver the best potential, the most efficient um, markets to be in with the highest um, impact. So I'm gonna get into some charts here and a lot of these are, are eye charts. Um, where, we, where do we start? We start with our um, looking at the top 25 markets. The top 25 markets um, represent the majority of visitation um, that comes to um, St. Pete Clearwater. And we know between Florida and Atlanta, that's over 40% alone. So what we want to do here is we look at these 25 markets and we want to determine where are opportunities. So where do we really have the best opportunity to drive that, that volume, um, that economic impact, we're, we're markets that maybe we said, okay, we've been in there a few, month, a few years. Maybe let's dial back a little bit so that we can go into another market that may be really looking great. Um, and you may remember, when, after COVID, the Midwest really popped for us. People were traveling, and so we jumped on that opportunity to look at those as developmental markets. Um, you may see that a couple of those markets now are, are not looking as great, but we don't want to pull out of them because we've made the decision to be in there, and it's important to be in there for multiple years. Um, and then we've got in-state. We call it in-state maintenance. And the reason we call it maintenance is because people are more familiar with us. So we can look at the media mix a little differently when we go into like a developmental market where people don't have as much awareness of who we are and where we are as compared to in-state. Interest interestingly enough, we pull this every single year, but the top 25 stays the top 25. You may have a couple that move up and down a little bit, you know, from year to year, and maybe there may be one or two that come in or come off the top 25, but, but, but by, um, you know, for the most of them, they pretty much stay the same. 
So we group these together when we start looking at how we want to build our model. And we put them into three buckets. The first is the large size markets. These are our larger markets that we want to go into. And, and these markets are ones that are within the top 10 list of the most um, expensive markets to be in. So we, when we do our model, we do it through building an indices. And an indices allows us to compare each DMA to each DMA. Anything over 100 is great. We look for over 110 um, to really identify the most opportunity. But what's important is we really have to look at similar sizes when we, and, and similar markets when we build um, this model. So the first group is this large size, more expensive model um, markets. Then the mid-size, here are the markets within that, within our top 25 that we looked at. And then our Florida markets. So let's start with this eye chart. So first and foremost, this is our tier one developmental markets. These are all the mid-size markets that, that we have. Each of these columns represents one of these data points that we talked through. My most favorite is the very first one, and that one looks at the comparison of the audience, the number of people in the market, as compared to the cost to be there. Um, that's really important. And so if you see a market that's over 100, that means that that market is an efficient market to be in. Um, great opportunity. When you see the numbers go down, it means it's expensive. But we don't want to look at that just by itself. So as you go across, there are different factors here. Next one is looking at opportunity. How big is that market? When you continue to move over, you want, we, we want to look at how many people within that market actually align with our audience composition. So we want to look for those people that we know would be likely to visit. As we continue to move over, you can look at people that have visited our website. People are showing interest in going to the beach and interest in going to Florida. Then we take all of those and average them over to the right. And what you see is highlighted in the red are the markets that are the top markets um, over that 100 marker that we're looking for that says, these, these are likely good markets for us to go in. Of course, you know, we want to look at everything, and not everything is based solely on this data. But this gives us a really good indication of these are probably pretty good markets. And fortunately, those markets continue to rise to the top. Um, Zartico does their own model analysis for an opportunity. And it's great to see that when we do ours and they do theirs, we're seeing a lot of similarities. So you know, it's great to kind of see that validation um, as we look at markets we want to consider. Um, you'll see in yellow here, we've got one market that has popped, and that's Grand Rapids, looking at it as, as a potential opportunity. You'll see that Nashville is still looking pretty good, but it's, but it's going down a little bit. Um, so we want to look at those. As we are, are looking, OK, well, which ones do we think we want to uh, consider? We know we want to consider the reds, but we're looking at a couple that we may want to move down to um, maintenance and then maybe bring in a new one um, with Grand Rapids. As we look at tier two, this is where you see your bigger markets. If you look in the first column for New York, that looks pretty sad. You know, I mean, that, that, that index is not a very good index, and we know it, it is the most expensive market to be in. But we also know that it has some of the, the most volume. And given that we are still, I would say New York and the Northeast is still a pent-up market, given that they were some of the slowest markets to rebound um, and start traveling after COVID. So as you look to the far right, those numbers are really high. They are very interested in coming to Florida. They are very interested in going to the beach. They are familiar with us. We index extremely high with them coming to our website. So when we look at our markets there, we have quite a few that we would like to go into. Of course, New York is going to be one that will ha have a caveat in how deep we can go into New York based on that very first index there when it gets to cost. Um, the beauty is, is, is Chicago performs very well here. You can see that it continues to pop. So us being in Chicago, this is another validation. This is a great market for us to be in. It's a little bit more efficient than being in New York, um, but poses a great opportunity. Okay, in-state. So again, we look at our in-states against um, one another. Um, Orlando, of course, we know always rises to the top. And interestingly enough, Jacksonville continues to be a very efficient market for us to, to, to be in. 
Um, Miami, we've been out of Miami for a while, mainly because Miami is expensive. And if you look there again in that first column, that index reflects that Miami is expensive. But we do feel that maybe it's time to, to try to go back into Miami. There is a lot of opportunity there. They are interested in, in us, and especially when it comes into, uh, we've seen great visitation into St. Pete um, for a lot of the arts um, out of Miami, and we think that, that could, it could be time to go back into there. Um, a consideration for that. So as it gets down to, here's kind of how we're bucketing it. So our developmental markets, um, here's our, our list for tier one. We've asterisked where we think, you know, depending on our budget and how far it can stretch, this is our priority. So the ones that are asterisks would be our, our second priority. If we can afford it, we will go into those tier two um, developmental markets. We'll try to go into Grand Rapids. The other markets um, we're, we're pretty much putting on, we would like to put into the plan um, uh, for maintenance and for developmental. We don't stop there. So we look at ethnicity by market. Um, basically applying the same exercise, we take the top 25 markets and we look at each of the markets and we index um, the population in each of those DMAs um, by ethnicity. Um, so, as you can tell, all the ones that are circled in red um, are what we would consider, you know, potential opportunity. They are above the 100 uh, index, um, and we've done this um, both for um, black, Latino, and LGBTQIA+. So, this is where we net it out. The markets that, um, this is the markets that we're trying to go, you know, looking to go into that are circled here in the red and what rises to the top. Now, why is this important? In our general um, marketing, we include everybody. We, you know, we are an inclusive destination and everyone should be reflected in that, in our marketing, in our messaging, in our activities and so forth. So, um, I want to say that first and foremost, that everyone is included in, in everything that we do. Um, but we do want to look at opportunities to reach these audiences through unique and different ways where, where it makes sense. So you'll see Chicago and Atlanta um, pop for black audiences. Um, in those two markets, there is a, a publication called Rolling Out that we've been in for a couple of years. And we want to continue to be in that because that specifically reaches that audience in those two markets. For La Latino, you'll see that Chicago pops and so does Orlando. Um, we've been doing radio in language on, on Hispanic stations in those markets as part of our radio buy. We don't call, call it all out, but we do it in language as a way, again, to extend into, into that audience. And LGBTQIA, we look for specific ways, whether it's through um, radio or through its print, we look at where are there opportunities to specifically reach that audience in addition to what we're already doing in our general market. And interestingly enough, in Minneapolis, um, there is a wonderful publication, Lavender, that we um, started, and I think it was last year. Um, and, you know, again, a way to very specifically reach that audience there. So we look for those opportunities um, in market. We also want to make sure in the markets where, you know, we may have a heavier Latino audience or LGBTQIA, when we have our out-of-home boards, those have a single image on them. So we want to make sure that our mix of images, along with our product, um, aligns with those particular markets as well. Our next step is looking at consumption. So we've talked about our audience, we've talked about the markets, we've talked about timing, but now really what are they consuming? So we will look at each media channel, and our, our audience are heavy consumers of media, period. They over-index on, on everything. Magazines um, continue to perform well. Our audience are heavy readers, and uh, magazines are a great upper funnel awareness um, tool. It drives a lot of interest um, when people are dreaming. Um, radio continues to work great. Um, and a, as a mid-funnel, both upper funnel and mid-funnel as a reminder and also as a way to people visualize, you know, a trip to our lovely destination. 
our audience, TV is probably the only media channel that um, our, our audience is not heavy consumers of as a channel. But our, our audience way over indexes on certain program. Our audience tends to do what we call appointment watching. They over index on watching news. There are certain streaming channels that they particularly look at, networks that they look at. So what we do is we make sure when we're doing our buy that we are in those specific placements where our audience is watching. It's not just a national broadcast buy. It is very targeted as close as we can make it to our audience. Out of home continues to work well um, with our audience. 27% are more likely to see out of home. So they're, so they're driving to work. They're out and about. Um, social media and um, internet, of course, um, they're, they're big consumers on. So this is a little bit of an eye chart, but I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of how do we put all this together. So when we look at our de developmental markets, these are markets where people are less familiar. We want to tell our story, and we want to focus on growing that awareness. We want people when they, in these markets, it's really important for us to, you know, have them dreaming about us. So in the tier one markets, here are the tactics on the left that we are looking to, to consider for these, for these markets. For tier two, here are the, uh, are, is the mix that we are considering um, um, for, for these. Now, these are the top ones. This is not, not, not written in stone, but we know that based on budget and some of these markets, like going into the Northeast, um, you know, we may have to look at a different mix than with tier one. For our maintenance markets, people are more familiar. Um, so it's important that we stay top of mind. We give them a reason to act now. Um, this is going to be really important when we look at digital. This is where we want to make sure that we, you know, with our OTAs, that we've got offers going. Um, and I know Scott's going to talk a little bit about that. But this is where you know, it's great that we have, you know, the offers like with Travel, travel Zoo um, in, in front of this audience. Um, so we, we look at um, employing more mid-funnel and lower-funnel tactics here. So for out-of-state, we're considering, you know, staying in Nashville and Cincinnati. We've been in and there. We don't want to abandon them, but looking at a, a little bit lighter weight of media, a little bit of a, a leaner mix. Um, but then in-state bringing Miami back in and going to Orlando and Jacksonville um, with the tactics, as you see there. Um, this is just kind of a summary. You know, we're focusing on need periods, but want to be in market as long as we can. We're looking at our primary audience at 25 to 54 with 100 thousand uh, plus household income um, with our developmental markets, both tier one and tier two, and our maintenance markets um, for in-state and out-of-state. So international, I know that's been something that's come up in a number of our conversations um, over um, the last few months. You know, how is, how is that looking? And, and I know Rose shared this with us um, when she presented her budget book, looking at really what is the opportunity within in, in each of these um, markets. Um, so this is the performance of each of these markets since 2018. Of course, we didn't even list 2020. Um, and as you can see, last year, Canada was really starting to rebound. And when we look at the volume that the U.S. drives versus what we're getting out of the other countries, they're important, but you know, Canada is really the one that's popping, um, popping the most. Um, when we look at the U.S. and how we're recovering, this is overall to the U.S. You can see that, you know, when it comes to leisure and it comes to U.S., basically we've recovered. But if you look in that red box, international is still lagging in uh, recovery and travel. And that breaks down to the countries like this. So this year we're anticipating that Canada will be back. Um, and the increases in Canada year over year are really strong. Mexico is anticipated to come back next year. And then you can see the UK and Germany and Brazil. And basically, um, they're all kind of laggering and staggering over the next, next few years. So for Canada, we know we're seeing a lot of, the, um, a lot of them uh, booking those short-haul flights. Uh, that's been increasing over the last 18 months. We know that they love to get out of the winter. They, they plan for a winter trip or a spring break. We know that they go up to their cabins in the summer. 27% um, of them are looking to stay in hotel motels, and we know that they also are very fond of our home rentals um, and resorts as well. 
So our strategy is, as we look at all of the um, international countries as a whole, we currently, I know you've, you've seen um, McKinsey speak and you've seen Rose speak about the initiatives that we're doing both through PR events, PR outreach, and working with um, the group travel agents. Um, we're going to continue to do that. Um, we're, but we know we need to, to start re-entering as our budgets will allow. So Canada is going to be first on our list. Toronto. Um, is our focus that is where that uh, where Toronto represents our biggest share um, and we're going to partner with brand USA um, we've done that in the past and it really is a great opportunity because it affords us more opportunity our dollars will go f further with them when we partner with them for that that's it thank you any questions members Russ yeah, I'll be glad to ask a couple of questions. Yep. Um, groups. Um, I can't remember the exact percentage of our total group business that fills room nights here. Uh, do we see a presentation on that? Yes. Um, when would that be? Ryan, do you know when we're going to do MNC? At our next TDC meeting. Oh, okay. <laughs> now now I have it to do. He's getting good. He's getting good. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kimball. <laughs> No, we, we're actually working on a, a meetings and, and conferences plan. And I think that's one of the areas that, just like with international and everything, groups are back and, and what type of groups are coming and that type of would be interesting to see. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. And we have more hotels um, up in Clearwater Beach and, and down in St. Pete that are doing some more uh, groups of our size that we can. The other question is, um, do you get involved in the uh, airline side and the money we put in for there? Yes. Um, uh, Katie does have money in the leisure budget that she holds out so that we can do partnerships with them throughout the year. So we will be doing um, different programs with them. And we'll get a little review on that one too? Certainly. And there's some great strategies right now going on with meetings and conventions. I've been looking at some of the trending and some things that really, I think, bode well for us as a destination. Uh, third question, um, somebody brought up that uh, the groups of uh, the luxury group that we have now upscale hotels uh, on Clearwater Beach and they're being built and then also in downtown uh, uh, St. Pete, there's more boutique hotels that are upscale and all. Are we dressing those in a separate area or including, how do we look at that? Uh, I think we're evaluating that as, as one of our, our segments um, within all of this. They are a great audience to be in because when we have a recession, luxury travelers still travel. So we still want to make sure that we're messaging that. And I believe that with some of our, specifically in the traditional within some of our publications, we have some publications that we're considering for luxury. I'm not in that group, but in the same token, I draft that group. Well, and you know, I don't know that we, and I'm going to differentiate a little bit. I'm going to say that we're considering upscale, but not quite luxury, because luxury would mean a lot of properties, Ritz, Four Seasons, JW. We're not there. We're not there yet. But upscale, we're starting to move to upscale. So I think and that's what drafts the rest of us uh, on it. Also, I think uh, the question to look at is um, the brands and non-brands and the reservation systems and everything that do influence uh, those reservations. Uh, I can tell you that on Clearwater Beach, there's now eight Marriott products, uh, and I haven't lost any occupancy. It blows me away on the different choices that people have, and we haven't lost occupancy. And so, yet, it's equally to those that are non-branded in other areas have their own reservation systems that we have to watch, too. So I think that's something we could be looking at a little bit for an update, too. Yep. Yep, and Thank I've seen you. some of that, so I can look at that. Thank you. Certainly. Anyone else? Um, Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Carmen, great presentation as always. Um, just a couple comments and questions. Um, interesting to note how the Northeast is coming up on our radar. Um, I think historically we've always thought that the Northeast traveler goes to the East Coast of Florida. The Midwest traveler goes to the West Coast of Florida. Um, your data suggests that that may be shifting and that our, our uh, visitation from the Northeast is increasing. Um, 
clearly a different demographic, um, a, a different income level, and encouraging as well. So I, 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 I think the, the money spent in those developmental markets makes sense for us. Anyone else? Yes, yeah, so a couple, just a, uh, another Sorry. point, Madam Chair. Um, you know, it's interesting to note that, uh, that when we look at international travel, how the UK, um, amid all the other countries, has spiked. And I can't help but think that that is due to increased um, airlift into the Tampa Bay area and that while it's not back to where it was pre-pandemic, um, certainly money spent there could be, could be uh, a good idea because as that continues to come back, I think it'll come back with, um, uh, with a vengeance on us. And, and lastly, and um, Madam Chair, this is really one for, um, for you and the BCC. You know, listening to Russ talk about um, new hotels, uh, upscale hotels coming in. How well do we partner with um, uh, economic development and, and sit and chat with them on how we can aid and assist in their efforts to encourage more hotel development, um, just business development into Pinellas County? Um, in my years on, on this board, I've not heard a lot of discussion about that, and, and I think it's something that could, um, could bear fruit for us as we look to the future. How can, you know, we're some of the best salespeople for Pinellas County, and uh, if there's ways that we can partner with um, economic development, we should do so. I, excuse me for... I just want to share, thank you for that suggestion. And Brian, it may behoove us to invite Dr. Johnson as a guest at our next TDC meeting to talk about the ways in which the economic development piece that we have in Pinellas County is partnering with a lot of the other D EDCs around the region and especially in global Tampa Bay because I was recently fortunate enough to go with them to London, and it was extraordinary some of the things that we were able to, you know, attend while we were there, and the things that we learned and the different markets that were opened up to us, and I think it would be a very valuable effort for us <coughs> to work a little more closely with them. And to that point, I also want to share Russ's comments really spoke to my heart because I'd like you to be thinking between now and our next meeting about ways in which we could strategically expand our board. It was interesting to hear Russ ask about airlines and do we partner with them, et cetera, et cetera. But don't you find it a little interesting that we have our own airline right here in Pinellas County, the Pinellas County owns, and we don't have a person from there on this board. I was recently out at PI, the Clearwater International Airport, and learned that they have had the greatest number of folks fly into that airport this last month than in the history of the entire airport. And I found that information really staggering. And if you don't know, you might be interested in knowing that they are in the process of building a brand new runway to accommodate some of the bigger jets that are going to pilot their new jet from Pi. And I'm so excited to share that my oldest son is a pilot that flies for Allegiant, and he'll be one of the first pilots to fly one of those jets into Pi. So I'm very, very hey. proud. So I think we could, you know, have someone from Pi maybe on our board and or someone from Tampa International that could give us a real world view on what they see coming and going from the airport, if that's interesting to any of you. How do we make that happen, Madam Chair? 
We have the man right here, Brian Lowack. <laughs> so as uh, Commissioner Long pointed to, there are uh, a number of opportunities that have been um, brought up in the past, um, but as we dive in more and we look at uh, those opportunities and how we can best utilize our time and your talents, as well as the talents of our industry partners, um, we are uh, further evaluating how we can integrate um, other partners on, uh, on the things that we do, such as um, finance, such as marketing. Um, so what that looks like, I, I, I don't have an answer for you today, but that is something that we're currently evaluating and we'll be bringing to you um, in the near future. In other words, stay tuned. There's really exciting things on the horizon. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Mayor. You know, I mean, back in the day when I was on this board from 99 to 2005, we had monthly reports from PI and from TPA. They came in. George Elby was a TBA, and Russ, you'll remember that. And I forget who the person was from PI, but we could at least start with that until we come Great up with suggestion. another solution. Or right. if it does, if not monthly, maybe by, you know every other month or what have you. But anyway, I see Doreen's puzzled look on her face. Can we help you out? <laughs> no, I was just thinking that I think we're getting the PIE reports um, on a regular basis. At least, is everyone else on the TDC? Yeah, we are getting those. Yeah, which is helpful. Microphone. Kate is yelling from the I'm back. Sorry. I uh, I think it's a great suggestion, and uh, it's one of those things where I think we just make it happen as quickly as possible. It shouldn't take an act of Congress, Michael. I don't know how we do that, but uh, <coughs> well, uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> of course, because he's gonna mess with my plan. Not not necessarily mess, just clarify. They couldn't be actual members of the council because that's dictated by the Florida legislature by Florida law. You could, we could try to fashion some type of like adjunct or, or mm -hmm. representative capacity to give input to the TDC as needed. That would be something I could talk to Brian about in the chair. But um, excuse me, what do you mean we can't? You know I hate that. <laughs> I know. That's why I'm saying we can't have them appointed to the board. Why? We might have them be able to participate why not? because the special act that creates this board says who can serve on it, and it doesn't say any of those uh, particular members. Well, I can't help it if they're small-minded. There's I, nothing to say that we can't I fix agree with that. you. That, that's why I think we tr should try to be creative and create a position that maybe isn't Let's on the chat. BCC, on the TDC, but yes. Let's chat. I look we'll forward chat. to it, yes. Thank yes. you. <laughs> One other thing, and I don't want to get into politics, but recently I had lunch with Mayor Castor and Mayor Welch, and they were talking about some of the pushback that they were getting from groups because of some of the new state policies. Have we seen any of that, especially with the groups you put up there, the, the minority groups and what have you? And, and Brian, you may be able um, to answer this better. I know when we've talked to our meetings group, they have expressed that they aren't, aren't seeing that. Um, I just recently went to um, a meeting where um, Stacy Ritter from Fort Lauderdale was there, and she's very outspoken because they have lost quite a few. And their concern has been not only the ones that we're lo they're losing now, but the ones they don't know they're going to lose in the future. I think fortunately for us, we've so far we haven't seen a lot of uh, blowback, have we? Uh, visit floor a visit Tampa has, and he was very concerned when we were in San Antonio because large yeah. groups, and it wasn't so much about the politics, Mayor, as it was about the rhetoric, and the language, and how large groups that have booked here in the past are canceling yep. because they find it unfriendly and unwelcoming. Yep. Russ? Uh, we have lost groups because of the decision of our legislators in this last year. I think we've lost three groups. There you go. And it's not just for one year. It's for groups going forward, too. I know in Miami we've lost a major amount of groups, too. And it's not just for this year, 27, 26, these groups have all made decisions not to come back to the state of Florida. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, words matter. 
and it's important that that message gets conveyed so with all due respect to our great attorney over here this is one of the things we need to chat about in terms of our governance model because county administration is has assured me that we can move around with the with the model we have to accomplish the same goals and so i look forward very much to having that conversation with you and as a former legislator i certainly know how to be creative so i look forward to these upcoming conversations they're going to be so <laughs> stimulating thank you everyone yes uh, chuck thank you madam chair um on a non-political non front, a um, uh, couple questions for you. You talked about um, the markets and on this side of the Mississippi, but yet Denver just kept standing out to me. Um, it's not one that we normally talk about, but yet um, it had a MM index of 111, which is pretty high. It's obviously a very expensive model because you've got it over there in, in the visitation index at 33. So can you talk a little bit about Denver? Sure, we've got Denver, Dallas, and Los Angeles um, have, have been popping, um, and we are watching them. Um, but they would be a brand new market to go into, um, and I think right as it is now, we've really focused more on the east of the Mississippi just because of the momentum that we've built, um, but they are on the radar. Thank you, and my, my second question, you, you talked about decision-making 90 days out. Um, and I think you guys, I, I believe you guys do a great job as stewards of this $14 million budget that you spend, and Katie spends. But we know that August and September, when we look at the seasonality um, of our business, so do we t um, slow down our advertising dollars 90 days before August, September, which would be May and June, um, because those decisions, they're not coming here anyway kind of thing. Um, we actually started our campaign um, end of June, July, trying to push for August, September, October, November. Um, and although the majority are at 90 days, not everybody is at 90 days. So we are, yeah. we do, we, we, and we tend to spend more trying to push the need periods than other times. So we, we have been out there in late June, July, looking at trying to push for later into the fall. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And next, Brian, on the agenda. Next, we will have, if Eddie's here, he'll come up and he will introduce the digital side of the marketing. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'll, I'll save my presentation for a little later today, but I wanted to introduce uh, Scott Bacon, who is uh, our account supervisor or account director with Miles Partnership. Um, you know, digital works almost completely different than, than traditional in a lot of different ways. Those conversations about Denver or, or Texas or California or, or even, you know, somewhere else in America, um, we try to reach them through behavioral targeting and through identifying, um, you know, the people who are most willing to come to our destination and visit. So. Uh, it's, it's kind of a totally different way to, to think and strategize, but oftentimes digital will support uh, what we're doing in the traditional with their markets while also being able to kind of scout ahead and look at, okay, where are other opportunities to expand? Let's, let's try to do some testing in these new markets and see the response. So with that, Scott, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. There we go. I went a little far there. Sorry about that. So, um, as Eddie mentioned, it's pretty different on the digital front. Targeting's different. The markets are different. It operates on a lot of different levels. So I kind of wanted to set the stage a little bit, talk about performance, kind of our review and our outlook, how we strategically do things, the approach that we take and how that differs. Talk about making a larger investment. There was a decision packet, and we, we kind of wanted to talk about that and what that looks like, because it is very different in how it would operate. And finally, take any questions that you might have. I, I do want to talk first and foremost about just the value, 
the ROI, the diminishing returns, because I think that's really important. Generally speaking, if a dollar comes in to visit St. Pete Clearwater, a dollar and 50 cents is created in value. I wish I was getting that when I go to Vegas, but that's not how it happens, unfortunately. But that value and that ROI is something that's extremely measurable within the digital sphere. This is a nice graph. What you're looking at over here is year over year, the traffic growth, and we have the same spend. So you're looking for these two bar graphs, January through June, what happened in the organic channels as far as the traffic to the website? And year over year for that six month period, you can see that organic, the folks that came without aid to the website grew by 30%. For the paid channels, where we're advertising to get folks to come to the website, it grew 56%. So it's kind of a nice control looking at the organic growth and the paid. The amount of spend was identical over that six month period. So you had really strong growth in what was driven to the website. Again, same budget, about a half year budget of 2.7 mil. And that outpacing, in essence, also turns into ROI. <clears throat> if we take just the hotel revenue created, and so for all of the advertising that we do using Adara and other data technologies and partners, we're able to see, did somebody see an ad and then did they book? Did they book a hotel? Just the hotel booking alone so over that period was $9.2 million worth of total revenue for the $2.7 million in ad spend. And that's just the hotel revenue. Doesn't include dining and entertainment and all the other things. And that ROI, again, just gives you a sense of how much upside there is within the sphere here. Here's Another thing I think that we want to think about, too, is competition. So in the news, Brevard County, record spend, Miami CVB launched two massive new campaigns just in the last 90 days. Visit Tampa Bay announced the, the launch of the largest ever out-of-state winter campaign in its history. Visit Florida has added 30 million. Now let's take another look, which is Dentsu Global Marketing is a widely respected marketing agency that kind of tracks what's going on in the advertising sphere. These graph lines that you're looking at are the different kinds of channels from different kinds of media, out of home, print, and other formats. All of those are relatively flat. But take a look at digital. That's the purple graph at the top. Over every year, you can see how much more digital advertising there is out there. And this is all different across the United, the United States and the world, and it's all industries. But you can see how much more digital there is. That competition within the digital space, space is getting much more cluttered, and it takes a bigger investment to really punch through and stand out. These are some of the challenges that we're facing. Increasing spend and competitive spend from other destinations, as well as the, the big giant increase that we're seeing in digital spend. So, given all of that, what's the strategy, what's the approach? This is a small sample of the kind of data that we look at. And as you can see, a lot of this is very powerful infographic style data, but a lot of this essentially is baked into everything that we're doing and all of the markets. MRI Simmons, eMarketer, Adara, Zartico, Arrivalist, Destination Analyst, Website Analytics, Advertiser Analytics, STR, Key Data, all of this effectively gets baked into the strategic things that we do, where we buy, how we buy, and what we buy. And some of it gets even pretty fascinating. There's a, a graph here that helps us understand and shows that when somebody comes into Tampa International Airport from Atlanta, where do they go? And do they move across the county or do they effectively just stay in one location? And you can compare that to data from New York visitors, Miami visitors, St. Louis visitors. All of this information also helps us under, understand who's valuable. Who do we want to get in front of? Who has strong spend? who is really creating strong economic activity within the destination, that in part is also a big function in the digital sphere of what we're getting in front of 
and how we're reaching folks. So there's three kind of big ideas behind digital that make it a little bit different. The first is the behavioral, and we've talked about behavioral. Behavioral means that effectively what you're doing is you're using folks' digital interactions across what they do to understand them in a deeper, deeper level. A demographic target is we know certain things, we know certain publications, and we may go after publications or channels in a traditional sphere or even in a digital sphere for which we anticipate that females that are married with a household income greater than 75,000 that live in New York City are likely to be a visitor to St. Petersburg Clearwater. On the behavioral side, it works kind of different. The bottom fact there is really the fact that comes into play. We know that somebody bought two first class tickets departing Wednesday, returning on Sunday from Los Angeles International Airport to Tampa. That's somebody we want to get in front of. And we can find that person across the digital sphere and say, let's serve them an ad. Let's get in front of that person who just bought a ticket. And they may not fall into the traditional demo. They may be male. They may be single. Their household income may be a little bit below the 75K threshold. And they live in Los Angeles, a market that we don't necessarily typically reach. That's what we do. That's where we're different in that we are specifically looking for those behavioral interactions and indications and signals of intent and targeting those folks. Second big thing that we do is in search engine marketing. And when you think about search engine marketing, one of the things that you're thinking about is this is somebody who is clearly wanting something that we have. They're looking for a beach. They're looking for arts and culture. They're interested in a Florida vacation. They want to plan a meeting. They want to have a sporting event. And the world of SCM is a big area where, on the digital side, we're getting in front of meeting planners and groups and sports enthusiasts and a wider range beyond just the typical leisure audiences to target them. SCM is one of the ways, too, that we have reached that allows us to go far beyond west of the east of the Mississippi and cover the other half, where we see people really popping, like Denver, like California in Los Angeles, San Francisco. And certainly we've really branched out a lot this year in Texas with very strong results. SCM also allows us to be targeting folks based on conversions in the sense that Google and its technology allows us to effectively look at the things that we're doing, track it, use technology to say, you, you went and did something very interesting. The ad that I served to you resulted in you getting a, a visitor guide, having it sent to you, and enrolling in our email, and spending four minutes on the website. That's a really engaged person. And so that ad worked really well for you. Can we continue to really funnel and optimize so that that ad hits more people? Because this ad seems to really drive the desired behavior, the things that we want to do. That kind of level of technology through Performance Max and other Google technologies enables us to be highly effective in finding people that have high propensity to do the things that we want to do, to have the spend. And all of that really is a function of just the nature of digital. It's programmatic, by and large. Traditional marketing and direct marketing tend to be manual. You work with a sales rep. You do insertion orders. There's fixed pricing. It can be more expensive, and it's publisher-focused. On the programmatic side, it's automated. We work in platforms. It's real-time bidding, most of the time. It's dynamic pricing most of the time. It's more cost effective almost always. And it's definitely very audience and behavioral focused. We see what people are doing, we understand what we're doing, and we get in front of them because they're doing the kinds of things that are indicative of our visitor and who we want to have in the destination. All year, we do a lot of things across social, search engine marketing, programmatic, and custom. It's our always on. It, it, it's tricky because 
on average, folks are planning on the 60-day and 90-day cycle, but as hoteliers, Russ, you certainly know, a whole lot of folks book two days, three days, and four days prior to arrival. And you kind of have to look at frequency distributions as opposed to averages because there's kind of a big crunch that's really close in, and then there's a whole big lots of little data points far out into the future that could be 120 days, 180 days. But that crunch in the front is something that digital is very effective at in the sense that we know when people are doing things and we can get in front of them. So always on is an important part of digital in the sense that we're never off air. We're always pumping out across a variety of different channels to connect with people that may be booking tomorrow in September when we really want to make sure we're getting in front of them. So we talked a little bit about making a larger investment. What does that look like? What do we do? So there's a couple of big things. Build more aware awareness, of course. Um, but equally important, drive the actions. We're going to be able to get in front of more people that are doing the kinds of things that we want to do, like buying a ticket from LA to Tampa. Number two, we're going to leverage the wide geographic reach that digital enables and be nimble with markets, go in and out and see how things are changing. We can also shift strategically to behavioral targeting where that is made possible through technology. But I think one of the most important things is really is to meet people where they are, to, to use and access them in the channels that they use for planning travel. Not everybody goes to the website, not everybody reads magazines, not everybody listens to the radio, not everybody engaged with social. One of the biggest things is word of mouth. And so a lot of times when you're in a variety of different channels, you're making sure that all of those things are working together to create that awareness. That awareness drives a higher propensity to consider a destination. And it becomes part of conversations becomes part of word, word of mouth. Being in more channels and having greater geographic reach is where we can go with digital and really gain some efficiency as well in value adds that we create for what we buy. So if we funded, this is what that looks like. Today, our current budget provides for display, native, in-stream, in-stream in video, and native across a variety of different channels as well as programmatic through Adara and other channels that allow us to make sure that we have behavioral, contextual, and retargeting. If we add budget to digital, you can see all of the additional channels that open up and allow us, in addition, to use really smart technologies, distillery, AccuWeather, in-market, near, to continue the targeting that we are currently doing but the budget constrains us from getting into these additional resources. There's a lot of really smart companies out there that enable us to effectively target. What does that look like as far as kind of the buy and maybe some names and brands that you know? Today, we're in Adgenuity and Hulu. If we add money, we can add Peacock and DirecTV. In custom content, we could add Travel and Leisure, New York Times, Washington Post, Connas Traveler. In rich media, we could add Wonder Kid and Cargo. Probably don't mean anything to you, Wonder Kid and Cargo, but they're super cool rich media advertising platforms. But what you do, I'm sure now, is online. Again, the restricted budget that we have today, we're in really solid buys. Travel Zoo, TripAdvisor, Hopper, and Expedia, but adding to that allows us to branch into kayak, hotels, and orbits. And we know there's good folks there. There's people who use orbits, and that's what they use. Getting in front of them, I think, really allows us to, to be more effective. Today, we're in New York, we're in Boston, we're in the Northeast because it's digital. We effectively, through digital, you can make hundreds of millions of impressions for the budget, and as opposed to tens of millions of impressions for the budget. It's, it's that efficient in what you're buying. Adding to budget allows us to go out. And it's, it's a little hard to see in this graph. California is actually a slightly darker shade than the rest of the area that's not in the, uh, the outline there. California is a good market. 
Texas is also a very good market. We entered Texas about a year and a half ago because we started seeing it pop uh, post-pandemic when things kind of started to open up. It continues to be a really strong market. Denver, great city. There's other really great cities that are excellent sources of business and we know from site traffic, analytics, market intelligence, and all the other resources that we have that there are plenty of folks that we can't get in front of today that we could through expanded reach. And second, if we can get them in the channel, in orbits, for example, that we can't get into today, again, we're gonna have big impact. So um, thank you very much, I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Scott, as always, well done. Um, you know, not to, not to take money away, Carmen, from uh, traditional advertising, but I, I completely agree that we should have a focus on more funding for social. For all the reasons that you lined up, um, efficiency, uh, cost effectiveness, uh, instantaneous communication, uh, it's critical. Um, you know, I think about the fact that most of our hotels here in Pinellas County are resorts. They're not business travel hotels. While we do have some, the majority are, are resorts. And we've seen it um, where travelers, leisure travelers, are waiting to see what the weather is going to be for this weekend. They're not buying today on Wednesday. They may wait until Thursday night or Friday morning when they see the forecast and then decide, yeah, we're going to the beach this weekend. And um, our ability to reach out at that critical time and boost our advertising to those in-state uh, travelers could be key. Um, I, I just I, I, I would encourage Brian as we as we build our budgets, and again, not to take anything away from more traditional advertising uh, channels and vehicles, but I couldn't agree more with Scott that we need to put more money behind that there. Um, secondly, and lastly, I, I'm so glad to hear you talk about California. It, uh, it arguably is the second biggest economy in the world, and um, I think we have we have fruit to bear there. Appreciate the comments. And, and, and to your note, this is St. Pete Clearwater's team, Jimmy, Eddie, and there is amazing engagement in social, just the organic. Sure. And there's good pay behind it too, but it is a huge opportunity. I don't. I work with a variety of DMOs, and I look at a lot of DMOs. St. Pete Clearwater does better in the social channels than most anybody that I know of, um, just naturally. Putting some paid behind it can absolutely move the needle, 100%. Thank you, Madam Chair. I go back to the days of when, when Leroy was standing up here presenting when, when this was a, a, a new platform for us. And the budget, I believe, my memory says, was a million five, and that's when we collected 60 million in bed tax, and then 70, 80. Now we're at 100 million, um, and the budget is now 2.7 million. And we've talked, it seems like I remember talking about it almost every year, it's such a, there's such a need to increase that budget, um, but it really hasn't happened proportionate to where our bed tax collections are. So, um, I'll say it again, when we, it may be too late, we haven't, um, we never approved the budget, but regardless, the TDC is, is well along to do that, but I think the, that our budget is, um, for this, is not enough. Um, I think it should be quite a bit higher. You had mentioned um, adding 1.5 million to your budget. Is, are you hoping to see that in this budget cycle or 2024? That's these folks, not me. <laughs> So there's a proposed budget that um, the administrator has proposed to the county commission, and, and that additional funding is not in there. I just wanted to include that because as we build out our marketing programs, um, I've got to have them show what we uh, kind of plan for two different scenarios where um, uh, once we 
gather more data and information, um, we can always go. The TDC, the TDT money um, is goes into reserves, and we can go back and ask for that money at any point in time. So it's not in the current proposed 2024 budget, um, but we plan to make a case for uh, why it should be um, amended in the future. Thank you. And, and from a competitive standpoint, you talked about these other markets, our own state with Visit Florida as well as Brevard and, and Visit Tampa and those others. In your presentation, you said they plan on spending in Brevard County $9.78 million to market tourism. Is that both traditional print advertising and digital, or is, are you just referring to that's what they're going to spend in digital? I don't have the breakdown. It just says marketing. It just says marketing, correct. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. You know I'm the worst. Uh, I, as a member of the County Commission, I am happy to make that plea on behalf of Visit St. Pete Clearwater because I know from my own personal experience that in my last political campaign, we shifted almost 80, 90 percent of our budget away from conventional media that we've all grown up with and come to know and love so much. And the thing that intrigued me most about the world of social media, even I don't, I'm certainly no expert and I don't know too much about it, but the one thing that really, really got into my head was almost immediate analytic data that you could get from your campaign. And it can become so finitely targeted that it's, it's mind blowing. And you cannot do that with print. You cannot do that with anything, any other form of media in terms of the analytics that you get back. And I just think that we are missing the boat if we don't exponentially increase that part of what we do. Because the last time I was chair of this body, I think our budget was around somewhere between 42 and 48 million. And here I am again, chair, and it's projected to be over 100 million. But this particular piece of the budget hasn't increased exponentially like that. And I think it's a, an opportunity that's really missed, number one. And number two, I know for a fact that one of the things that county administration is looking for is that analytic data that proves that what you're saying is absolutely accurate. So there's an opportunity there, Brian. I certainly hope we'll take advantage of it. And I see Kevin over there. <laughs> okay. Um, question, do we need to make this a motion or a first priority or can we move forward on it? What's the steps to help? We got the chair's um, enthusiasm to make it happen uh, and then you're on it. Do we need to make a motion to increase the digital one request as soon as possible or for 24? Would that be helpful in the argument, Brian? Well, I will say that. But in, you need the research. In, yeah, you. in the in the May budget meeting that the TDC had, um, I believe you all did um, include those comments and yeah. make that motion. However, um, and and we're aware of that. Um, we are in the process of putting together this data, um, and we will be once we have that and we're able to tell that story, we will be taking it um, to the next step uh, to justify added added uh, revenues. And just to clarify, uh, Mr. Prather asked what this was at, what our budget for digital was. It's currently in the uh, proposed budget, it's at $6 million. Oh, okay. The, the 2.7 was six months digital spend. There's w website build and other things that make up the entire 6.0, which is the annual. Again, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Ryan, next. Next up, we have a present, an up, quick update uh, from Craig uh, on our From Visitors with Love campaign, which highlights the value of tourism. Good morning, everyone. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction and opportunity. Uh, for the past several months, I've been teasing how VSPC staff has been actively developing and working on a value of tourism campaign uh, to engage Pinellas County residents. And happy to report to you today that on July 27th, AKA 727 day, we officially launched this value of tourism campaign and we're calling it from visitors with love. So uh, today providing you a quick recap on the launch as well as uh, next steps for this campaign. So to refresh you on some of the campaign goals, um, this is educational in nature, of course, so to educate our residents and businesses on the value that tourism brings to our communities and how it helps make St. Pete Clearwater the ideal place to live, work, and play for residents and visitors. Some of the strategies um, under consideration here, we wanted the campaign to live underneath the Let Shine umbrella, but also have its own distinct look and feel. Uh, we wanna engage the local audience when it's most meaningful, expand our ongoing communication and education of that value of tourism, <clears throat> and then develop leave behind assets for residents and employ a phased approach. So 727 day was the launch of phase one. So uh, some of the assets that we just deployed here for uh, this initial phase on the left, you can see our landing page. So this is a one-stop shop for all things about the campaign. We're funneling all the residents to this website to learn more, take advantage of some local partner deals um, and really engage with us um, on our website. So as, uh, asset number two here, and actually handed out some copies of our flyers. So um, on one side here, this is our main collateral piece. This, this is essentially all of our talking points when we're at events, uh, talking with folks, but a few things we're emphasizing, and on the first page, or first um, side here, $11 billion of economic impact, $6.7 billion in direct spend, 109,000 jobs, uh, supported by tourism, $94 million in bed tax, and 15.4 million visitors. So that just gives you, or gives the residents, an idea of the overall impacts uh, to the Pinellas County community. And then you flip the page, and this tells the story of how those impacts trickle down to the resident themselves. So how funding goes towards beach renourishments or to local attractions, local events, and how those locals uh, benefit and enjoy those amenities as well. Um, we've included a couple QR codes on here, again, redirecting folks to the website to learn more, but also take advantage of some of the partner uh, deals um, from those local businesses that are participating with us. And then we've added uh, some, some basic signage to have at events, uh, again, with the QR code, but I do like the, uh, the phrasing here, white sand beaches funded by those who wish they lived here. Um, so we're building up uh, our activation, uh, our various strategies, and um, as far as 727 day goes, how the launch went. So um, we hosted two pop-up events here. So um, at 727 AM at the St. Pete Pier, we partnered up with Cafe Tuk Tuk, uh, the City of St. Pete, and the Peer Events team to uh, host the Surprise and Delight event. So uh, what, basically it's a media event. It wasn't so much a heavily promoted event in advance, but for those locals who showed up, it was a surprise and delight. So we offered some free coffee to those who stopped by, talked with us, learned a little bit about the campaign. And then similarly at Coachman Park at 7 to 7 p.m., uh, we hosted a similar pop-up event, um, but at sunset down at Coachman Park, and we offered free uh, gourmet popsicles from Frio's Pops. So fun little integration with uh, some local businesses down there. Um, in addition to that, we had our brand activations team on site. So they're pushing these flyers, communicating uh, to the locals, um, all these talking points. Brian was on site giving some media interviews, had some really great coverage that I'll get into here momentarily. Got a fun little video here that our uh, social media team put together. 
This is the 727 AM event down at the St. Pete Pier. Had a local chalk artist come out and join us. A lot of fun down there. And then I did have an issue with the second link here, so I don't think this one's playing. We'll give it a second. All right. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, yeah, you want to give it a try back there in the control room? So it was a nice little 30 second segment on Tampa Bay 10 and uh, had a wonderful interview with Brandy Bolden, our team member over here. Um, she uh, you know, just gave the highlights on the uh, campaign. So uh, I'll address that link later on and share it. Well, excuse me, was that supposed to be the 10 second video that you just showed there? Cause I didn't- There were two videos on there. The first one played, the second one on the right did not, the link's not working apparently wanted to hear what Brian had to say. It was actually Brandy, what Brandy had to say. Okay, what Brandy had to say then. All right, uh, as far as results so far, so the campaign's obviously still in its infancy here. We hosted the two local pop-up of events. We engaged with about 400 folks, uh, dispersed the program pamphlets. We had 17 partners participating with us on the website and they've offered 24 uh, deals to the residents. Um, from a PR media perspective, 15 placements, over 386 million PR impression, impressions, excuse me. And you can see some of the examples of the media outlets that provided coverage. And then 429 sessions on the website that have lasted uh, about a minute in uh, length. So we're excited people are going to the website they're spending some time on there. They're learning uh, about all the different offerings and benefits of tourism. As far as phase two goes, so we got our eyes on phase two. Uh, I love the Berg. So um, we've engaged them and they actually released their uh, feature on the campaign at the end of last week. So I'll share some updates on that um, once we uh, get some data there. Uh, BBK working closely with Katie and Carmen on ramping up the next phase of assets. So uh, from an on-site activation event standpoint, we have tents, um, umbrellas, all sorts of branded gear that we're gonna be mobilizing for our local events, really help our uh, engagement pop there. Uh, we're working on a value of tourism presentation, a PowerPoint that we can take out into the community. And then additional signage that we can uh, leave behind in some of the facilities and attractions that we fund. Um, and then next steps, brand activations. You can see us at any of the upcoming elite events. So um, there's the P1 Powerboat Racing Series. That's Labor Day weekend. We'll be on site with this campaign. And then at the end of September, Clearwater Offshore Nationals. Uh, same goes there. And then before you know it, we're in, into October. It's fall event festival season, um, so lots of engagement coming up here. And then uh, the community relations team, they'll be out there with that PowerPoint presentation, sharing with the chambers, the local partners, uh, municipalities, uh, all of our uh, local stakeholders, and uh, giving that presentation an update. So uh, we're definitely getting out in the community, getting after it as far as sharing the uh, benefits of tourism. And that's all I have. Thank you. Questions, comments? Commissioner Prather. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick one. Um, we don't have a lot of events uh, this time of year, um, but the powerboat races that you mentioned are coming up. Is that something where you'll make a presence um, coming up? Correct. So that next phase of assets uh, where we're, we'll have tents and um, an umbrella stands, some really nice branding that will be in this theme in the campaign uh, from Visitors with Love. So we are anticipating having those assets on site at uh, the powerboat races. Yeah. This is really good. I like this. Doing the numbers, it looks like 22% of the people that are working in Pinellas County work in the tourism industry which has to be our number one employee, you know, industry that's employing people and our number one economic engine. So, I mean, I always say that, it'd be nice to have that information too, so people can really, really understand how important it is. Well, yeah, and when you have these pop-up events, it sure would be nice to know about them because calendar permitting, 
maybe some of us could be there as well. Correct, and that was more of a, a time sensitive, like lack of lead time. So uh, the details on those pop-up events came together so last second. We, it was a it was a decision to not actively promote them. But moving forward, obviously the campaign is now ready. We'll be uh, pushing uh, some publicity around it as well. Perfect. Thank you. Any anything, Brian? And just two things to add to that, uh, Mayor. Um, the information that you referenced on there, it is extremely good data, and they're quick, they're easy to remember. Um, one of the things that you will see in our next presentation is that our local residents understand that there is a value of tourism uh, to Pinellas County. However, this campaign is focused around uh, emphasizing and explaining in better detail exactly what that value value of tourism is to each and every one of our residents. So um, that's why we're gonna. That's why we rolled this out, and that's why we're gonna continue to lean into this. And second, um, on the events, one of the things that we will be working on, uh, Chair Long, is putting together a an events calendar. We have a number of uh, elite events um, that uh, uh, the tourist develop. Or, excuse me, the CVB supports and the BCC funds, and uh, we wanna make sure that everyone is aware of when those are um, and what's going on throughout the year so you can plan accordingly. Perfect. We'll try to support you as much as we can. Thank you. Did you have something, Commissioner Smith? No? No? Everybody happy? Thank you. You know, I was remiss when we first started the meeting today because I neglected to introduce um, Mayor Gaddis over here, who is our newest member to the TDC board. So you'll notice he's been remarkably quiet throughout the meeting today. So do you have any comments that you'd like to make thus far? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am uh, uh, truly grateful, honored to be here and uh, to join this, uh, this wonderful uh, organization and a, a crowd of, of uh, business and uh, political leaders here. Um, speaking of this program, I, I was holding back a little bit because I'm, I'm learning and uh, I'm kind of getting the feel, but I think that this program uh, from visitors would love. I believe that this is something that uh, the entire county has, uh, has needed for a long time. Uh, many people, uh, I, it's it's my opinion. Many people feel that um, they uh, that tourism is is the only thing that that we all care about, and uh, and that's not really the case. We actually uh, we we care more about ourselves first as as a community, um, and then uh, tourism is is what actually makes us thrive. Uh, so I would love to see this go to everyone eventually uh, in the county because um, education will will actually make everyone feel better whenever they're in their cars and they're uh, not happy about the traffic or there's a, a weekend event going on and, and it's hard to get in and out of their house uh, or their their uh, neighborhood uh, so uh, thank you for the warm welcome madam chair i appreciate it and uh, thank you anyone else Ryan, next. Next up, we'll be joined by Sean with HCP, and he's going to go over the resident survey results as well as the strategic plan. I don't know who made that agenda. I am not Sean. My name is Robert Allen. I'm vice president at HCP Associates. I promise you, you're happy that I'm here. Uh, so, just one quick point to mention before I jump into the survey results. Uh, the importance of community building in destination management and stewardship is crucial. And with all of the discussion, uh, Chair Long, about beach tree nourishment, I think that's another important opportunity to get in front of the community and say, look at what the tourists are helping us to do. And look at what they're helping us to rebuild and re-nourish. So I, I think that's a fantastic point as we start to talk about the value of tourism in the local community. That is a great point. Thank you for putting that right up here. So uh, I have two updates today. The first and the little bit more long-winded one is our presentation of our resident study. This resident study was incepted as part of the strategic planning process a few years back now as a means of getting a, a temperature gauge on what the average resident of Pinellas County feels about tourism and how it impacts their lives in Pinellas County. So, uh-oh, what happened here? 
So this is our second iteration of this study. In 2023, we, in essence, it's 1,300 respondents conducted via telephonic survey instrument from uh, April through May of 2023. This is a representative sample which is controlled for gender, race, ethnicity, age, geographic location within Pinellas County, and education. All right, now we can at least see the charts. So this produces a series of different recommendation scores. We start out by asking whether people would recommend Pinellas County to a friend or family member as a place to live, vacation, retire, work, and open a business. What we see throughout this is that there has been a growth, thank you, there has been a growth in these categories on a marginal level with one big exception, and that is the recommendation of whether they would recommend Pinellas County as a place to live. Obviously, because this is a study of residents, we love to see that people are happy living in Pinellas County, 97% making that recommendation in 2023 in a, a nine percentage point jump from 2021. We do see a couple of small drops, but they are within the margin of error. The one that I would wanna take a look at uh, maybe in the future, and this might be more of a Pinellas County or as opposed to a TDC type of initiative, but just looking at that open a business score dropping, again, that's, that's within our margin of error, so it's, it's, nothing, it's not a big story yet, but it is a, a noteworthy point. And something I wanna note is this time around, we're measuring whether people are familiar of visit St. Pete Clearwater itself. So what we see is about 60% of our sample had familiarity in an unaided or unprompted way. So we say, do you know who is responsible for promoting tourism in Pinellas County? And they say yes, and they provide some variant of VSPC's name. Uh, when, you, when people don't know the answer, we have a, our questionnaire process asks them, well, have you ever heard of Visit St. Pete Clearwater? And once you, at, once you provide that prompting question, that score rises to 95%. So I, I always try to make a very important distinction. You want a very high unaided brand awareness. You don't want to have to remind people of what we're talking about to, met, to show that people are aware of the organization. Having said that, I think that you would see that this is a good score compared to other destinations across the state and across the country. More than half, again, familiar with the DMO itself. So we see that 91% of Pinellas County residents continue to express a strong belief that tourism is important for the future of Pinellas County. An additional 88% believe that tourism benefits everyday residents of Pinellas County. And I don't know what happened to our formatting here, but you can see that these numbers have basically remained flat from the pre previous two studies, staying at these high values that they were originally at in 2020, 2021. We ask our residents, when it comes to the following items, would you say that tourism makes things in Pinellas County better, worse, or approximately the same? Again, I'm not sure what happened to our formatting on this presentation, but I want to call out a couple of important things. Tax revenues, local economic conditions, the variety of activities and amenities, the diversity of people and cultures, even things like jobs, beaches, property home values, and parks and preserves. All of these things you see with this large blue bar with these ugly numbers in the middle of it, those are all things that residents in the majority believe that tourism in Pinellas County improves. In, on, in contrast, there are some things that people believe that tourism worsens. Many of them are kind of what you would associate and assume uh, that comes with additional people. So things like crime, litter, crowding and congestion, and traffic. I, I like to use the crime example as a very salient point because this is a perception study. Anybody who looks at the crime statistics more seriously knows that most crimes are not committed by out-of-market visitors who are spending multiple hundreds of dollars every night at a hotel room. Some, but not the majority at all. However, it's that perception that matters the most when you're gauging resident sentiment who aren't specifically engaged in a particular topic. So again, Commuters make up a huge amount of the traffic in Pinellas County, but 80% believe that tourism is, is contributing to that in some form or way. A 
Additionally, this work, this work explores whether people take advantage of the same types of attractions and amenities that tourists do as residents in Pinellas County. And we see large numbers of our residents visiting parks, beaches, taking trips, day trips to other areas of Pinellas County to enjoy almost as a tourist would, you know, going from St. Pete to Dunedin for the day, uh, attending sporting events, visiting museums, attending music performances, and attending parades and festivals. We did see some reduction from the 2020-2021 data to the 2023 data in people doing some of the outside things like chartering a boat, renting a watercraft, or even staying at rental properties in Pinellas County. So there's a little bit of that staycation energy that may have dissipated somewhat. But in, in general, we see that our residents are doing the same types of activities in many cases as our tourists. When we ask about how they make plans, the residents, we do see that there is some opportunity for this cross-promotion. And I know the work that was discussed with the calendar of events is a good example of that. So we see that when they're looking for these events, word of mouth is, of course, king. But television, Twitter, Facebook, and other social media rises as well. This provides a pretty clear opportunity. Once people are in the market, it's not, just resident, it's not just tourists that you're reaching, it's residents that you're reaching once you start to promote these events and activities. This is a very, very important slide, and I'm so grateful that it hasn't been corrupted by whatever formatting issues we're having, because more than eight in 10 residents believe that several aspects of Pinellas County are partially funded by visitors to the county, including beach renourishment, where 88% of residents believe that it is partially funded by by uh, tourists, local infrastructure, sporting venues, and cultural venues. Very few residents believe that visitors fully fund any of these projects. And so again, going back to this point about beach renourishment, there is an opportunity for education, such as the new campaigns that are being done by uh, Carmen and the VSPC teams, to in improve this and to drive home that point that this is something that the out-of-market visitors are bringing to you as a local community. In terms of sales tax revenues, a similar story emerges. Only 15% of respondents were close to the fact that about one third of the penny for Pinellas tax revenue comes from out of town visitors. So it, the, the sales tax, the penny for P Pinellas data, it's all about building this story of how much is the tourists bringing into the local economy. If we look here, we see that in general, the, the biggest category is 43% saying that they had no idea how much the sales tax is contributed to by out-of-market visitors. That 43% is a large jump from the last time we asked that question. I truly, I think that a lot of that is just respondents being a little more honest. But there's a huge opportunity here to educate the local community about all of the benefits fiscally, <coughs> asset-wise, cultural-wise, that out-of-market visitors bring to Pinellas County. We ask a similar question about how much of the workforce is in tourism serving businesses. I know Mayor Anks mentioned that, and that's another good example. 41% have no idea. They won't even, they're not even willing to take a guess as to how much of the population in Pinellas County is employed in the hospitality sector. Again, with, I believe that, that figure you said it was 21, 22%? Yes, sir. So 22%, that's a big, big chunk and if people don't know about that, they may be a little bit more hostile towards developments that relate to tourism, especially when it comes to new developments. So just to summarize our, our research findings, and the, there's a full report that you all should have access to as well. Recommendations have generally stayed flat with the exception of the recommendation to live, which jumped substantially. Uh, we see that support for tourism amongst county residents still remains high. People believe that tourism is good for the county. They believe it's good for their local community. Residents continue to enjoy a variety of attractions and amenities available. And they believe that tourism improves several aspects of Pinellas County life, including tax revenues, the local economy, property and home values, the variety of amenities and attractions, and more. So that, that's a, our quick update on our resident study. 
That's intended to use a benchmarking approach to be asked every couple years so that you can measure and see this as a KPI itself, how, how residents are scoring on this study. Uh, something that I think will be a very exciting opportunity to enhance the study with in the future will be the recollection of specific campaigns and activations that the VSPC team uh, is going to be doing. So there's going to be an opportunity to test some of these events themselves in this work in the future. But then I wanted to shift over to our KPI update. So we've been working with the VSPC team, including the newly hired market intelligence specialist, I don't see her in today's crowd, uh, to compile the original base values of all of the KPIs that came about as a result of the, str the strategic plan. So to remind us of what those are, we have all of these yellow objects are the objectives of the strategic plan that you all saw. The blue, the blue boxes, and I'm, I'm not going to go through each one, don't worry. The blue boxes are the KPIs that came out as a result of that strategic planning process. So VSPC recently hired that market intelligence specialist. She's been working with several team members to compile those scores, going as far back in some cases as 2018. Basically, there's a, going to be a dashboard of about 50 different numbers that you guys are going to be able to look at that measure each uh, goal in a department-by-department -department basis. So, for instance, in the business development department, we've got some KPIs like number of elite events with a certain number of attendees, uh, film incentive dollars provided. Some of these are metrics that we keep track of currently, and others are being created now using some of the new data assets and platforms that the VSPC team has acquired in the last year or so. This continues through our community development department. KPIs, which many of these have to do with new initiatives that were, again, started just now. Uh, for instance, a few examples of these included, include total active community ambassadors, number of community meetings attended by VSPC staff as a part of the educating of the partners, stakeholders, chambers, and other business groups, and uh, let's pick another one, cultural and placemaking dollars provided. Then we have marketing. So marketing is, of course, perhaps the best tracked now but there are still some new KPIs being developed that are designed to measure the specifics of uh, specific event activations. So using some of that geolocated data, there's going to be the opportunity to measure more specific visitation numbers. So are people going to events, for instance? Uh, are they going to events driven by Cross Bay campaigns, so partnerships with other counties? Are they going to uh, oh, where's that other one? Here we go. Total visitors to arts and culture institutions outside of St. Petersburg. So that was one of the KPI goals, not because we don't like the arts and culture institutions in St. Petersburg, but because we wanted to make sure that the marketing and promotion was spreading the love, if you will. So some of these new data platforms are going to enable us to actually draw those polygons and report on that in a way that you haven't seen in the past. Uh, what I will say to all of that is there should be an update on that front in time for the next TDC meeting with all of those initial values and where they are currently as of 2023. So that's something we're working on right now with the VSPC team to execute. Uh, I know I moved a little quickly because we had some formatting issues, but are there any questions from you all? Questions? Anyone? Commissioner Smith. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, what was the size of the sampling of the residents? 1,300. One, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Doreen? Just a comment on the um, educating of the residents about the tourists paying for all of these things through the tourist tax, the bed tax, as we call it. But also, do we also have the component to help educate the residents as to the <clears throat> um, background on the, um, gosh, uh, Penny for Pinellas and how that integrates? I know we've mentioned it here, but I think do the residents need to know more about that? It's so there's a there's a couple of I'm, I'm so happy you mentioned the penny money. So it's the penny money numbers are a great est they they are, they're pulled from the sales tax right. So they are directly related to that. So by using that number, we already know how much the sales tax contribution is from the out of market visitor. So thank you, Penny for Pinellas people. You've helped me do my job a little easier. But the 
the other point I want to make about that program is people see those little green signs. People see those green signs that say, penny money went here, and it helped to contribute. Don't you like that? Isn't that nice? Uh, that's something we've talked about, I think I've talked about before this audience once before. So you know, as we start to talk about developing new programs that are going to remind people and educate people about what the TDC money is going to, that's a great opportunity to use that as a, uh, a template, if you will. Anyone else? Anyone else? No? Ryan? Thank you very much, Robert. Um, next up, we've got Barbara St. Clair giving you an update on the cultural plan. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Isn't all that information just so exciting? I was thrilled to be listening to everything. So um, I'm here to talk about our cultural plan. And uh, I wanted to start with a little bit of a description of what we are getting. Um, it's a roadmap for sustainable, equitable development of the arts and cultural sectors for the next five to 10 years. And it's very interesting to me listening to these presentations. Um, Carmen and Scott both talked about arts and culture as integral to the growth and development of our county and uh, support of tourism and attraction to tourists in our county. Um, it is part of our unique, arts and culture is part of our unique offering to attract tourists and retain tourists and bring them back to the county. So our cultural plan will be evidence-based, aspirational, and achievable. Um, it's going to provide vision and priorities for an innovative cultural framework, including policies, programs, and action steps for implementation, strategies to guide and strengthen the county's arts and cultural future, and guide current and future public funding and investment in the arts. Uh, I want to remind everybody that there has not been a cultural plan in Pinellas County since 2005. And what I like to say about that is, the iPhone came out in 2007. <laughs> so <laughs> we are very, very due for this, and that um, we are really oriented to providing this cultural roadmap that is going to help us know what to do, know how to do it, and to be successful. So why we want it? We want to move the needle. Um, I'm a, oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, Today, a majority of our arts and cultural visitors come from Florida, and 96% of them visit cultural attractions in St. Petersburg. We see that as a great start and also a wonderful opportunity. So our goal for the future is to capture and build on that same energy and make it countywide. I know in our last presentation, uh, there was a KPI for what's going on outside of St. Petersburg in arts and culture. And we know, Creative Pinellas knows from our data, that about 50% of the artists in Pinellas County live outside, live and work outside of St. Petersburg. And about 50% of the arts and cultural institutions are outside of St. Petersburg. So St. Petersburg sure is the Jupiter in our solar system. We have a lot of other planets. Um, so we want to capture and build on that same energy countywide. We want to harness the economic power of the arts. And then we want to position Pinellas County as the top arts and cultural destination. Right now, the research does not show us getting the kind of attention from potential visitors that we deserve. So we want to really tell that story. And then, of course, we want to sort of provide the infrastructure to make that story uh, realistic and to happen. So a quick overview of our accomplishments. Um, in the first quarter, we created the RFP, and we worked in partnership with Creative Pinellas. At, uh, Creative Pinellas Visit St. Petersburg, Clearwater, and the county administration. We identified a number of consultants we wanted to make sure we reached out to, because this field is well known for who the really successful um, cultural consultants are. We wanted to make sure that we got somebody who was very data-based and research-oriented, because our county administration really counts on having good data. We published and advertised the RFP in Q2. We formed a selection committee that consisted of representatives from the county and visit St. Pete Clearwater, arts and cultural leaders in Pinellas County. And we determined uh, through a very rigorous process that a consulting group called the Cultural Planning Group would best meet our needs. 
I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them in one minute, but uh, I want to tell you what we've been doing since then. So we recently signed the contract. We've had a kickoff meeting, and also I want to very quickly introduce you to Margaret Murray, who's here with me. She is going to be our arts and cultural liaison for the cultural plan. Margaret has degrees in cultural geography and uh, arts administration, worked at the MFA, and also has done research on arts on health and well-being in the arts and placemaking in the arts. So we're really excited about her. She has great contacts throughout the county and will be an excellent representative uh, for uh, cultural, uh, the cultural planning group. So what are their strengths? They have a clear understanding of the role that the arts play in Pinellas. We made sure of that. They have the tools and skills to provide the results we need. They're really good at community integration and arts innovation and community engagement and facilitation. They have a lot of background in cultural, public arts, and strategic planning, in cultural and racial equity planning. And then two things that were near and dear to my heart, culture, sector, and market economic analysis and data visualization and asset mapping. So one thing you sort of always want to watch out for with cultural planning is that all the feel-good stuff, and you want the feel-good stuff, and people are going to give you back the feel-good stuff because arts and culture touches emotions, but you also want to root it in facts and data. The other thing we really liked about them is some of the experience they bring to the table. I'm not going to read all of these, but in each of these columns, you'll see something about increasing tourism, engaging with visitors, supporting the growing creative economic economy, promoting arts and, excuse me, promoting arts and cultural experience to visitors. So they come with that background. So moving forward to create our cultural roadmap, the strategic direction on how to move into the future, identify the resources, assets, and policy needs we, uh, we need to get there, and then distinguish Pinellas County as a world-class arts destination. I think we all know that it is. We have presentations from uh, Hank Kine from the Dali, for example, and we know that people from around the world come here to experience arts and culture. We need to really wrap that story in a, in a bow. We're working closely with Visit St. Petersburg Clearwater to make that happen. We think that information we get from this cultural plan will give us a lot of data and tools to move that process forward. In terms of that process, we are in plan development, data collection. Right now, we are going to be forming a leadership task force. We are then going to move to community engagement. And we will be coming before this, this community here and then the BCC with some early on in, uh, ideas about what we want to do moving forward based on that data so that we can position ourselves for uh, the next budget cycle. And then we will be doing inventory research and analysis, rollout and implementation, which will include a market demand study so we're going to know what the economic deliverables are from the actions that we take. Our cultural planning process will ensure that we get it right, and that's really important, that we're expansive in our embrace of the arts, that we're inclusive in our explorations, and that we reflect the county's aspirations. And that's pretty much all I have for you except two things. If you would like to be on the uh, advisory board, please let me know. And then I just got some information. I know, uh, Commissioner Williams, I think you mentioned England, the UK. We recently had an exhibit um, at our gallery called Imagine Blackness, which focused on AI. We were written up in a magazine <coughs> called Far Out that is published in London. They somehow captured our information and wrote about us and how amazing and what a leadership role Creative Pinellas and obviously Pinellas County, because we're the local arts agency representing Pinellas County, um, was playing in bringing attention to arts and artificial intelligence. So if you would like to see that write up, I will get it to uh, the team at Visit St. Pete Clearwater and we'll share it with you. Um, that is my formal presentation. I'd like to ask if there's any questions. Anyone? Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. I guess All right. everybody's yeah. pretty satisfied. Very good, then. Thank you so much for your time. Oh. Commissioner Prather. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great job, as always, and, and we appreciate everything you do for the arts here in Pinellas County, so I just wanted to oh. say thank you to you before uh, you left the podium. Um, in that um, thread of arts, though, a question for Brian. We have um, now, I guess, the county commission has approved a, a large chunk of money, 25, 26, 24 million for the Dolly. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that. And secondly, our next big investment is St. Pete History Museum, but I haven't heard an update on, on where they are. I know we approved that money a long time ago, but those two big big spends on our part are, are as the county. Certainly, so an update on, on those two. Um, uh, as many of you are aware, and um, we did uh, touch base on it on some of our one-on-ones, but uh, since I've got you all together, um, last uh, BCC meeting, excuse me, two BCC meetings ago, um, they did approve funding, capital funding for the Dolly Museum. It was in the amount of $25.16 million with an option to come back and request an additional $9 million, which would make up their entire, their full request that they uh, brought forward. In addition to that, um, at uh, recently we did receive a request, was contacted by the St. Pete Museum of History um, about coming back um, and amending their initial request um, that was approved at, uh, in the amount of $2.8 million. And due to inflation and added costs, they haven't changed this. The scope hasn't increased. It's, it's been inflationary costs, uh, material costs. Um, they will be coming back looking for an ad additional funding. Um, so I'm in the process of working with them uh, to determine uh, exactly uh, the most efficient, uh, quickest manner to get that forward, and we will move accordingly. Okay. Nobody has any other questions? Well, I have one. Why don't you bring everybody up to date with where we are with the raise? If you know. I've not been in discussion with the raise, so I, uh, we're working on, on some marketing. Uh, we have a marketing deal that we currently have with the Tampa Bay Rays, and um, we are uh, in discussions with them as far as renewing um, marketing, uh, a marketing partnership moving into the future. Um, we haven't landed on where that's going to be yet, but we continue those discussions, and we should be uh, bringing that in for landing very quickly. Thank you, Brian. And since we're on that topic, I would like to ask if any of you have any input about your ideas for what we might do should we decide to build a new stadium for the race. Is there a reason why you're making all those faces, Chuck? I think I can give you about a billion reasons. Is that what it's going to cost? I'm sorry? I think I can give you about a billion reasons. I think that's what it's going to cost. I'm just. I'm concerned. Um, the we've all been waiting for really years to have this discussion, and we're waiting on leadership and negotiations. Uh, we cl clearly understand that, but uh, um, are we as a board? I'm imagining going to be asked to recommend uh, about a third of a billion dollars. Um, Y'all did it. Russ did it once before. Um, so uh, uh, <laughs> was it? <laughs> Hey, you paid the bill. It's, it, that debt has been retired, so congratulations. But uh, we start again. It costs money, I understand. Um, but I, I think it's, uh, it's a political hot button. Uh, you don't want to be the, the BCC that lost a major league franchise team on, on half your voters, and then you don't want to be the BCC that, that spent $300 million on the other half of the voters. So I, 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 I cringe because, um, Madam Chair, I think you've got a very difficult um, political vote, um, and it's uh, you're in a difficult seat. I, I, I'm empathetic, I guess, is why I, I had that look because you're going to please half the people and make half the people mad. And no matter which way it goes, you're it, it's just very, very difficult. So, to that point, I would just like to say that uh, as a person who has been involved in the political arena, at the end of this term, it'll be 54 years. 
i dare say that you can probably take that approach on almost every single vote that we make that's why it requires leadership and a will to focus on doing the right thing and the right thing is that with partners we get more done and the county commission as well as uh, the rest of our partners, the Rays themselves, and the city, and a lot of our business folks have all come together to show the region that we can be very good partners and good stewards of the public money. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, that's why we're here, isn't it? And you have all been selected because supposedly you have that leadership and that courage to focus on doing the right thing for the most people who cannot on their own afford to do it themselves. So that's my pitch. Look forward to much more conversation to come. But I do and have been in conversations with Brian about forming a, what a like an executive committee within this body to discuss some of these things in detail so that we can make better decisions with you at the table, expressing your ideas and helping us as we go along. Mike? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree. Uh, leadership has to take the long view and um, the rays are important to our community. I, uh, I recently was in Toronto uh, two, three weeks ago on vacation with my wife, and we had the occasion to go to a uh, Toronto Blue Jays game. It was a Tuesday afternoon. Packed, right? There was not an empty seat in the house. Now, you know, one can argue that that's the only baseball team in the country of Canada, but when you compare it um, to the, uh, the pitiful attendance records that we have, um, it just underscored to both of us the need for the right type of stadium and the right type of, um, of, of public support for the Rays. Um, and, and I think that as a tourism board, we need, to be, we need to be actively engaged in supporting those efforts, um, be it from the BCC um, or however else we can lend our support to get that done. And uh, yes, it's, a, it's expensive, but what good things aren't? We need to, we need to get it done and um, I believe the long view will, will win out. I appreciate your comments, Mr. Williams, more than you know. And I think another question that needs to be answered in the minds of everyone when you talk about, yes, it's expensive, what is the price to our community without the raise? I mean, that's important to think about too. And I do believe when you see the schematic of what the new stadium is proposed to look up like, and B, it will knock your socks off. So I'm very anxious to begin those conversations with all of you and give us a couple more weeks and I think we'll have lots of new and very exciting things to share. Russ, did you have more? No. <laughs> no. No. Um, Said with trepidation. That's why we're all waiting to hear when we can the news and what is being thought and what's being proposed for this partnership of a lot of different groups in Pinellas County to financially pay for it and make it work uh, and all too with ownership and everything too and the development in downtown St. Pete. Excellent. And I think that's what we got to be looking at. While you're talking on this, do you have, do we have uh, items that will be talked on the September f earlier meeting with a BCC joint meeting? Is that 14th or? We're forming those now, right, Brian? In deep, Correct. deep discussions as we speak. These type of topics? Hopefully, that's the biggest thing on the agenda right now. Beach nourishment? That too. But I already told you, we're starting to work on that right now. 
So. Yes. So that would be, I know probably most of us for the last year, year and a half, we get our agenda in advance and we look over it and, and I'm, I'm eager to see an item about the raise um, and it's not there. And, and uh, I'm just shocked that it's August of 2023 and it's still not on our agenda. So I was pleased to hear you say soon. Um, very so soon. Very soon. I'll just... Uh, I mean, I'm just very anxious to see that, the presentation, the numbers, we've heard rumors, but uh, just anxious to see all of that. Well, and hopefully you can understand the reluctance to go public with all of the conversations that have been going on thus far, because we want to make sure that when we do make an announcement that all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed, as much as we can, right up front so that there are no questions and it's transparent and we have all the support lined up that we need to get this over the finish line because it is that important to not only our community but our region, I think. Yes, Mayor? Picking up on what Mike said, um, obviously I'm, we're all anxious to see what the raise and I, from my understanding, it's not the county's fault that it's been delayed, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but when you go to a, a modern major league ballpark, they call them ballparks, they're not stadiums, because it has to be an event. Absol when you go a to destination. When you go to Philadelphia, you see that there are a lot of people there, a lot of younger people. It's just, it's the place to be, especially when the team is winning. It's the place to be, and my son went up there recently with, with his children a month ago, and they spent time in the outfield climbing the wall and ringing the bell with the Philly Fanatic and playing wiffle ball. On the, so there's so many different things to do for so many different types of people, and that's what you have to have, and hopefully that's what we're going to have in a proposal and be able to take a look at it and go from there. And by the way, I'm so glad you're speaking because we are desperately awaiting news from the Phillies as well. well. Well, the Phillies would have liked to have been on this agenda, but in deference to the county administrator, he proposed a process to us that he said is what St. Pete followed, and we uh, are going to do that. And um, I am meeting with the people that are negotiating for the cities on the city's behalf for uh, our agreement with the Phillies Friday. We go to Philadelphia next weekend, the city manager and I. The rest of the council's not going, just so there wouldn't be any... Uh, um, be strategic. Yeah, I, let me, it's, it's, there wouldn't be any thoughts of any kind of sunshine violations. You know, no, we're not up there to negotiate, we're just up there see, as... We're, we're just up there as um, developing and continuing our great relationship. But they are ready to come forward, so we'll come forward with the county administrator first, and then I think um, there will be people talking to this board, and then coming for the f a formal presentation, hopefully sooner than later. And I think I told you all a couple months ago that the reason why they were delayed was because there was an ownership change, and that could not be announced. There was an NDA signed, and they couldn't come forward until that was settled. Major League Baseball formally approved that change. That's done, so they're ready to come forward, and uh, we're looking forward to that. And I knew all that. I was just giving you the courtesy of okay. I know doing the report. I know you did. Thank you. Okay. Any, Doreen, anything? No? Ross? No? Okay. Brian, next. Why are you laughing? So next we'll have Eddie uh, come up and he will be giving an update on the destination metrics. And you'll notice um, this is a little bit different than we've done in the past. Um, the president and CEO would typically give an update, uh, provide you some data points. Um, we're gonna switch that up. And today uh, is uh, Eddie's attempt. I, I kind of gave him free reign on this. Um, he's involved in the data, he and his team, on a daily basis, and I wanted to give him the freedom to go in and look at trends, look at data points that he sees as valuable, tell a story to you all, um, and then get your input on what's useful, what you would like to see moving forward, and we'll do just that. So with that, I kick it over to Eddie. All right. Well, good morning again, and happy to be back up here. Uh, yeah, so as Brian said, we kind of took a little bit of a different approach to this uh, month's uh, destination metrics presentation. 
Um, we looked at a few different factors in this, pre in this presentation, and this will be re replicable uh, for the next month or in, in for following. Um, but we added some different points of context when we're looking at our own occupancy numbers. So the thing I started out with first is a state of the American Traveler report with destination analysts uh, that kind of gives us an overview of, of what the uh, domestic American Traveler is, is thinking, kind of feeling, what their expectations are, um, what their perspective is really. Uh, the next part is, is really comparing how we're doing against um, the other Florida destinations that we're able to see through STR data. Uh, and then we have our traditional kind of reporting that we've done with, with our own occupancy data, how we're trending over uh, the years past. And then we also have a look at our visitor profile uh, with a few changes this month as well that will continue on into the future. Um, you know, kind of overall, what we're seeing is, in general, we're down in occupancy slightly. We're down in ADR slightly. We have uh, a little bit of a greater supply. Uh, demand, you know, when all those factored in are, is, is kind of flat. Um, so things aren't looking like uh, a doomsday situation, but obviously, you know, we always kind of want the numbers to outperform where we were a year ago. Um, so just kind of jumping in, Looking at the state of the American Traveler, this is a, a survey that Destination Analyst does uh, actually in partnership or in collaboration with Miles Partnership. Uh, we've got about 4,000 completed surveys each month that kind of tracks the different sentiment uh, for different uh, categorized regions of, of the uh, American Traveler. So uh, with 4,000 surveys, we get a, a pretty good confidence interval for this data. Um, and this is kind of a confusing graph, but, but I'll try to explain it because the next few graphs also kind of look like this. So we are about 2% down when uh, we asked travelers, you know, wh whether or not they're uh, feeling well better than they were a year ago um, from a year ago. However, you can kind of see the trends that this, this has taken over really the, the since the pandemic um, when when destination analysts started to do this survey data at, at a much more frequent pace. Um, so you, you, you can kind of see this, this volatility, and now it's kind of settling um, down and, 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 and actually kind of trickling back up from the, the previous surveys. Um, but overall, you know, it's, it's about a 2% difference, 30.9% uh, uh, compared to, I think that's 32 something. Can't really read that. Um, and we also have about a 2% difference in whether or not Americans feel it's a good time for them to be traveling uh, compared to where they were last year. And again, we're kind of seeing, you know, at the start of this graph, some, some volatility going back and forth. And we see this dip, and then we kind of see things coming back up slightly. Um, and again, just about a 2% difference from where we measured last year. Um, and then in terms of the budget, again, this is this is... Obviously not the best news. Last year they, they had a little bit more to spend on travel, about $4,300 and some change. This year they've reported closer to about $3,700, almost $3,800 uh, maximum, you know, spend on, on leisure travel. Um, again, you know, there's, there's some bouncing back and forth between these numbers. Um, but kind of some of the good news here is that we see recessionary uh, concerns you know, whether or not people are concerned about an oncoming recession, that is uh, tending to trickle down. Um, so it was actually at the lowest uh, at the time of, of their presentation. Um, and the sentiment for whether the next 12 months is going to be, uh, wh whether or not they're excited about leisure travel the next 12 months, that, that continues to kind of trickle up um, ever since they started recording this measurement. So a couple of positive things to see. Um, but obviously, you know, we're, we're not better off uh, in terms of the uh, perceptions of the domestic traveler than we were a year ago. When we look at um, Florida destinations, the numbers at the top of these, uh, at the top of these bar graphs are, are the change from where we were a, a year ago. So just kind of looking at um, different, different ones that I wanted to highlight, you know, in terms of occupancy, we, we're doing a little bit better than our other destinations. When we look at June occupancy, we're, we're a little bit you know, better than Hillsboro. Uh, we see the Florida Keys and Fort Myers. Uh, that, that's kind of an illusion there. 
Um, but we also see we're doing a little bit better than Sarasota, a little bit better than Orlando. Um, when we look at STR, uh, it's, it's kind of balancing, or I'm sorry, uh, room rates. Uh, we're, we're worse off than Hillsborough in terms of the, the change in room rate. Um, but you can kind of see where those uh, numbers skyrocketed for Fort Myers and the Florida Keys. Their room rates are, are way down. So kind of what this looks like in, in revenue per available room, we're right around that state number um, for, for June. You know, the, the state was about 4.4% 4 .4 uh, decrease year over year. This, uh, for us, it's, it's about 5.1%. But you can kind of see um, the fluctuation between all the different destinations. We're really kind of right in the middle um, when we compare ourselves to, to these other destinations. Looking at um, ourselves against where we were a year ago, you know, we see a little bit of a decrease in collections for uh, the June uh, development tax. Um, now I know what you're saying. This graph is a little bit different than, <laughs> than, than what uh, mine looked like. However, um, you can see kind of the year to date, we're, we're still doing better than we were uh, last fiscal year. That, that's carried by kind of the strength of, of the first few months of, of this fiscal year with, you know, particularly January, February uh, doing quite well. Um, and this graph is a little bit different. And last month, this was kind of just a, a chart with all the different uh, communities that we have and the tourism development collections. I, I made this into, into a little bit more of a chart to kind of show you the scale of these collections. Um, you can see, you know, miscellaneous at, at the top, but then the next highest uh, being Clearwater, then St. Pete Beach, St. Pete, Treasure Island, Madeira Beach. And then the squiggle line here is uh, actually the percent change year over year. So you can kind of see where it goes down the most is where there's the lowest uh, decrease in percent change. And uh, there's a, on the far right, this 0, 0.0, that's, that's where it's pretty much even. So uh, Madeira Beach, um, Treasure Island, um, you know, kind of taking the greatest uh, decrease in, in change there. Um, and just kind of looking at our, you know, what's available and, or, or another way to look at some of this information is, is the revenue uh, and really looking at where, where we are in terms of the scale of, of, of this year compared to last. We were down a little bit in revenue. The demand was pretty much flat, and the supply was about a, a 2% uh, greater increase in June. So then you can kind of see the numbers year to date. We're still ahead in revenue. Uh, we're still slightly ahead in demand. We're, we're uh, pretty close to where we were in supply, but we're a little bit more. Um, and then below this is uh, some information we pulled from COSTAR about what's kind of coming out in the pipeline. I know that this isn't uh, quite complete, uh, there was a few other projects that, that were there. This is just the data that we pulled from that report to sort of show us what's coming uh, up. So obviously we can see some of the bigger ones. We can kind of see um, the parent company really who they're aligned with, not necessarily that that's you know, the, the, the parent company, but there's some independent versus uh, branded hotels here. Um, and then really looking into the destination, the, the meat of the destination metrics, uh, you know, we have about a 2% decrease in, in occupancy for June. Uh, that's greater uh, when we look at key data in the vacation rental. We see about a 9% decrease. Um, there's something interesting going on there, I think, but we'll, we'll save that for a little bit later. You know, overall, we, we can kind of see some, some minor uh, decreases with, with the biggest loss being that uh, beach rate um, whereas the inland rate is, is pretty close to where it was uh, a year ago, and the occupancy is pretty close to where it was a year ago for, for uh, inland hotels. Um, so this is looking at our traditional hotel occupancy, and, and you can kind of see uh, you know, how we're doing in terms of, of occupancy year over year, and you can kind of see where it's trending uh, slightly below, um, really starting in April and, and continuing forward. Um, when you look at room rate, we're still pretty strong with, with our room rate. I mean, compared to last year, we're a little bit down, especially in 
April and, and May, but when you look at uh, FY23, which is that black line, it's, it's pretty close to the room rate uh, for uh, June. And then this is uh, looking at our vacation rental side, so that kind of coming back to that, uh, you know, we saw a decrease in occupancy, but quite an uh, interesting increase in room rate. Um, and this is looking at kind of a forward look. So we're sort of seeing this trend continue. And there's some other graphs I've, I've provided to provide some additional context in that. So this is looking at um, the uh, adjusted paid and owner occupancy. So you know, when a, when a vacation rental is, is occupied by the owner, that's removed from this data as well. Um, but we can kind of see uh, occupancy being slightly lower than where we were a year ago, uh, even looking towards future bookings with key data. Um, however, our room rate is uh, continuing to be above where it was a, a year ago for the vacation rental. So when we look at the revenue per available room, uh, it, it's pretty interesting how it how it almost tracks uh, where we where we were at least from the data that we're seeing in key data, uh, and this was pulled kind of at the end of of last month. So you know obviously this can change a little bit. Um, then looking at our last piece of data, which is our visitor profile information, um, this survey is uh, for the month of May was 553 respondents, so a pretty uh, decent survey number and. There's a lot of information here that we are paying attention to, but we can't, we, we don't necessarily, you know, are, are able to draw conclusions or, or what's causing some of these differences. But you can kind of see in the top left there, the number, the average time between decision to visit and arrival has gone down. And then on the top right there, the, the generations, this is kind of um, something that, that is interesting for us too. Um, we're seeing a, a, a greater percentage of the people we survey being in, in a boomer or older generation compared to the really the greatest changes where we were in the Gen X uh, population a year ago. And uh, we're, we're also seeing the average income uh, be lower than it was the, the past two years. Uh, and the daily spend also being slightly down. So, you know, again, this is, this is in interesting information, and I've asked DA to, to continue to kind of look and, and monitor into this so, so we can figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, we did break out the profile by the overnight visitor and the day tripper. Um, it, it's interesting to see some of these points of information kind of stay consistent. Again, there's a decrease in the average time, uh, average decision time to visit and arrive. Uh, there's an increase in uh, a higher percentage of, you know, boomer or older um, survey respondents. And there's, again, a, a decrease in the average income. Um, same thing with, with the day tripper as well. Um, one thing that I was interested to see, though, is the percentage of out-of-state visitors from the day tripper has stayed. It's, it's actually increased from where it was in 21 and a slight increase from where it was in 2022. Um, so, you know, my first thought was, oh, we've got more regional visitors, and that's kind of throwing the numbers off because, you know, generally they're in the market for less days. They're, they're not, um, they're, they're usually not spending much, as much on a, on a daily basis. But, um, it, you know, it, it's really hard to say that because when we look at even just the visitor profile, we're seeing people spend more days in market, and we're seeing the actual average of nights. Uh, still kind of continue to increase. So again, this is information that we're paying attention to um, and, and starting to track and follow and just be aware of um, if we need to make any marketing changes based on this information. And that's all I had. So I'm interested in, yeah, any feedback, any questions, any additional insights from you guys, I'd, I'd love to hear. Uh, Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eddie, a great presentation. I got to tell you, um, I'm, I'm very surprised to see uh, how well the boomers of my generation are doing, um, both in stays and, um, and spending. Yeah. Um, and while we all talk about, you know, the younger generation and attracting the families, I don't recall in any of our discussions on advertising, be it traditional or social, 
that we're targeting senior citizens as a target market. Um, does this data suggest that perhaps we should be doing so? It, it definitely brings into question, you know, who is uh, consuming what of our content on what platform. And I will say with our uh, most recent creative uh, um, campaign that, that we launched last summer, we made sure to take the effort to really uh, capture content of almost every demographic. So that way, when we knew you know, these changes were gonna happen, then we'll, we have the creative to come in and, and support um, you know, targeting maybe an older visitor than, or, or a slightly older visitor than, than we previously uh, thought. So, so we are prepared. Um, however, we also have to kind of look at, you know, like um, uh, Commissioner Long said, uh, or Chairman Long, I'm sorry, uh, you know, we have data on those individual platforms as well. So we can kind of see, okay, you know, on our YouTube channel, this is the audience that's consuming the content on our uh, Instagram channel, you know, this is the audience. When we have uh, our website data to kind of say, okay, this is who's looking at that information. So we can kind of make those individual adjustments at least from a digital perspective on those different platforms. And then I'm sure, you know, based on this information, it, it might suggest some uh, future ideas for, for Carmen and, and, and Katie and the BVK team to kind of take a look at. Uh, but it is, you know, the information that helps make us make those decisions. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Carmen? Please come, up to, please come up to the podium, Carmen. We do have some vehicles that, um, that we are using that do address that audience. Um, for instance, when we distribute the Gulf Debate um, magazine, we do distribute that through the New York Times, which has a more fluent and also skews a bit older publication. So we, we reach them in that vehicle. A number of the magazines that we do also index high for an older audience. And as, as um, Eddie just mentioned, we have some lovely photography of um, gray-haired um, couple um, that we use in a lot of our ads that um, are artsy. Um, so we are addressing that. We, we aren't specifically going out and buying AARP, but we, are, uh, we do have a number of publications and creative that does address that audience. Excuse, excuse me, uh, Mike, you'll learn. Some of us in the room don't want to admit our age, so uh, be careful what you're saying here. Is he speaking for himself? Commissioner, I have no comment to that. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Um, it would be good to see, a, not every month per se, but uh, maybe quarterly, a um, rolling 12 months of this data. Because the, you know, just looking at May, it's just one snapshot, which is helpful. Yeah. But it'd be interesting to see as those trends go, how they look in a year to date. One thing I'm really excited to share. So we've been um, working with uh, uh, Tourism Economics, which came out with a, a new dashboard. So. Uh, we start the kickoff call for that um, tomorrow, and uh, that's going to be really the focus of our market intelligence specialists is to uh, input visitor profile data as well as other data sources onto that platform so um, you're able to better access and manipulate that information as on an as-needed basis. Um, but yeah, I completely agree, uh, 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 12 months year to date. Uh, we do have a quarterly visitor profile that has uh, some more of, of this information. Um, it, it will be ready by next month. It was not ready for this presentation. Yeah. Anyone else over here? Doreen? Uh, thank you. Um, Eddie, I know that you had received some information. This has to do with the surveys of the visitors. And um, in the past, the survey numbers were about 403. So, in my understanding, we're up to 553. Yeah. Of the DA surveys of the visitors. Yes. So the, this May visitor profile was uh, 553. Uh, I've gotten back June, um, at, like yesterday, and it was also over 500. Um, so generally, you know, well, I, 
it's been a, it's probably been since 2020 that we only hit like 300 people surveyed. Uh, we usually try to at least get 400, if not, you know, 500 included in that. So the input um, related to that was looking at the um, consistent locations where those survey, the visitors are surveyed. And there's quite a few, um, obviously, in, in St. Pete um, and Clearwater, Clearwater Beach. But um, one of our colleagues did bring to your attention that there doesn't seem to be um, any mid-beach locations. And of course, there's Johns Pass and, and uh, Madeira Beach, which is obviously a very good location to be getting that information and came back with some suggestions. We brainstormed a little bit. Um, something that would be maybe Indian Rocks. So I threw out like Krabby Bills, um, the Harbor, the, the Splash Harbor Water Park that's there. Um, and then what about uh, something down um, Dolphin Landing or uh, the Hurricane or Caddy's uh, or the Island Way Grill, just some other locations to be seeking those those surveys and and I'm sure that this isn't every spot every month so if that was just kind of um, the game was just upped a little bit um, in some of those mid locations yeah that that's a great point and you know when looking at this data that's at one of the first questions that really uh, we need to have with destination analysts is making sure that the survey collection is is consistent is is thorough um, reaches, you know, all points, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're careful about maintaining the consistency of the visitor profile so we can compare year over year, but also making sure that we don't have any blind spots because that's important to fix over anything else. Thank you. Commissioner Williams. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Eddie, I wanted to um, uh, thank you for adding the information on um, upcoming hotels. Uh, I think it's, we talked about it a few meetings ago, so glad to see you've added that. Um, and I would encourage all of us, as we hear of, of deals that are happening, that we feed that information to you so that we can see um, what that development pipeline looks like for the area. Yeah. I think it's important for us to know. And again, thanks for adding it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I just want to give a shout out to some of the new staff and, and the existing staff that uh, has been working on uh, this information, you know, all summer. It's, it's been really helpful. I know that uh, TPA was, was mentioned. Uh, we actually have the passenger reports fully updated um, on our partner site. So, you know, we've been working really hard to make sure that we are able to provide, you know, this information on, on a regular basis. Anyone else? Right. Well, thank you guys. And we also uh, launched a more data a specific industry newsletter. So we've been, uh, we'll hopefully continue to send that out about once a month to help supplement, uh, you know, our industry updates and provide, you know, the co community with more information. So thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Well, um, before we, Brian, are we, at Brian? You're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, members, for indulging us today. Um, as I uh, um, gave you a heads up on, today's meeting was going to be a little bit longer. Uh, we had some longer presentations, but hopefully you found them valuable. And um, uh, I have received some of the, the input from you all already um, as far as marketing plans, um, data. But uh, if you think of additional things uh, that you want to see or we could do without please feel free to contact me at any time and we'll adjust accordingly. Again, we wanna make our uh, meetings uh, as fruitful as possible for um, the CVB, but each of you as well. As the chair stated, there are some strategies that we are going to be um, uh, moving forward with in the near future. Um, so more to come on that, thank you. Um, in the sake of time, I'm just gonna touch on a few things briefly. First, I um, want to let you know, yesterday at the BCC meeting, uh, the board did approve the elite funding events, uh, funding levels, um, in addition to the recommendation that was brought to them uh, from, that came out of the last month's TDC meeting, um, there was uh, an added uh, event that was put on that list, and that was the MLK Dream Big Parade. 
uh, at a funding level of $75,000. So it was a total of 35 events at a total of $2.12 million. And in addition to approving those uh, events, they also approved waiving of that $2 million cap for elite events. Wanted to let you know, um, next week actually, the chair, myself, and Andrea, our Latin American um, lead, will be going on a mission to Brazil. Um, we'll be there um, next week, and we'll be meeting with travel agencies, tour operators, as well as press. Uh, so we'll have some great news to share with you uh, once we return. September 6th through uh, the 8th is Visit Florida's Governor's Conference. Uh, Visit St. Pete Clearwater has a team of uh, five going to that, including myself, so we'll report out. And last but not least, just a uh, friendly reminder that the joint BCC-TDC meeting will be on Thursday. It won't be Wednesday. It'll be Thursday, September 14th, 9 a.m., Sheridan Sand Key. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Kimball. Is, and that means the TDC meeting behind it is canceled, or are we going to have that one too? Yes, we're, uh, we're going to cancel the September um, TDC meeting. Okay. And a, just a couple of comments, if I could. I think it's been a great meeting, great update, um, and, and all, and the time has been very worthwhile. And I think you've done a good job in making this whole thing together and very interesting, every mm -hmm. single subject. Um, is there a date, is in the fall, late fall, that we take this to the industry? after the marketing plan is done and all. Um, is that just before the end of the year? So typically, very timely, we actually, this came up yesterday in our staff meeting. Um, typically, we would go out in the spring. Uh, and what we heard was that the, our, our industry partners want that information earlier. Uh, so we are looking for a date now. As soon as we um, finalize, uh, get a better handle on when this will be finalized internally, then we'll be informing the partners on when we will have that event. But it will be, uh, we're shooting for uh, in the late fall, early winter. Great. Uh, another thing, uh, the digital budget of that one point something million dollars, I think that needs to be a priority. When you see our occupancy is down, and it's been down for each month this year, we need to step up. We got the money in the bank. We need reserves. We need to be really, I think that's the fastest way for us to get help get occupancy. Um, the other thing I want to do is say thank you to Stacy and the team uh, for the materials coming out, what, 10 days early? Um, in the last minute, super. Thank you. Anyone thank else? You. Anyone else? Mayor? Just wanted to let everyone know that tomorrow evening, the City Council in Clearwater is going to approve seed money funding for um, Amplify Clearwater, the regional chamber, uh, for a business incubator, which will be solely tourism businesses. So I don't know. I would hope that uh, they've already spoken to somebody in this organization about input, but uh, we would welcome that. I know they would welcome that and to see what uh, maybe where there are some voids that we could develop some new uh, businesses around tourism. I know we've talked about medical tourism, we've talked about sports tourism, we've talked about cultural tourism, just different, uh, any and all ideas and suggestions I think would be welcome by then and we're looking forward to them getting that going and seeing it be successful. Anyone else? Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have been uh, trying to fill hotel rooms in various properties in Florida for over 35 years. Um, every August, I am challenged, as I'm sure many of us are in the hotel industry, to figure out how to fill hotel rooms when school starts on, on August 10th. I think it did this year in Pinellas County. Um, and Madam Chair, perhaps you can, you can provide some guidance here for me. You know, we, we see the numbers that tourism is the number one employer in the state of Florida. Why is it that we allow our school boards to jeopardize a summer month and start school so early 
instead of starting it after Labor Day, the day after Labor Day, that most of the other states do so. We get to sell 10 days in August. Actually, we don't even get that because the parents are starting to get ready for school a week before. Um, is it worth it? And if so, how do we organize a, an effort at the local and state level to change that and have tourism dictate more to the school board than the very powerful school lobby? So, <clears throat> I'm so glad you asked that question. I actually have an answer. And rather than just blow up everything for today, I would like to run my answer by county administration and the school board and the rest of my colleagues on the commission and come back to you with a very well thought through plan. And with that said, and again, Brian respectfully and Kevin who's over there listening, at, at the risk of blowing up everyone's schedule, given the co conversations that we've had here today, the things that you already know are on the, are on the horizon, and the big decisions that we have going forward as it relates to tourism, to our county, and to our region, I, I am disappointed that we have decided to cancel our meeting in September because I think it is worthwhile to maybe hold everybody over for 20 or 30 minutes just to give everyone an update on some of the things like what you just talked about as well as the other things that we've talked about this morning that maybe aren't on the official agenda for the joint meeting. And I don't know if, the rest, if, if I can garner support for doing that or if it totally messes with your calendar, Brian. I don't mean to do that. Do it. But, I mean, we've got a lot of big stuff to do. And if you think about it, the end of the year is approaching and you're gonna be dealing with a whole new leadership team from the county on this board. And I rest my case. Mayor. Do it. I'm for it. No, you, I thought no, you wanted to no, speak. No, I'm saying go ahead and send, extend the meeting and, you know, do it. Yes? No. Anybody else? I don't have far to go, so uh, I can say <laughs> I'm just respectfully asking, because it's just me and my thoughts, and I don't know how the rest of you feel or think about it, but we cannot make decisions in a vacuum, and we've got a lot of stuff to do. Yeah, Russell buy his lunch. What? Russell, buy Russell buy his lunch. Oh, forget can... he's here. We're going to deal with him in another meeting. Right, Mike? Just say yes. I'll, I'll just pretend it doesn't matter. Okay, good. Uh, You've been aging over there today. <laughs> I know. It's Chuck? Been a long few years, Oh, come on. <laughs> Chuck? Uh, Commissioner Smith? Well, we'll fill you in, don't worry. Commissioner Prather, you have anything to add? Excellent meeting, thank you for your leadership. Would you stay for September? Should we decide to go that route? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Gladly. Commissioner Gaddis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and also, uh, thank you for opening up uh, the meeting with a positive note on beach nourishment. Uh, you're welcome. I, I truly believe that you're going to have less apprehension about discussing the raise uh, as this news travels and the project uh, begins to uh, uh, to take hold. And uh, I, I think it's a good thing, and I'm, I'm uh, very happy to hear this news. Um, great meeting and a very nice introduction and a wonderful time. Uh, meeting all of you, so uh, thank you. And would you be willing to stay for a little few minutes later? Well, of course. Should we decide to have a meeting in September? Okay. Um, I just have one last thing.
that we cannot adjourn today without doing, and that is, would you all please join me in singing happy birthday to Russ Kimball, because his birthday is tomorrow, and while he doesn't want to admit it, we all have an age behind our name, and he and I share the same number, so happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. No, my birthday is a two. Happy birthday to you. And that is not for me, because my birthday is not till November. So give it back to him. OK, without any fur if there's nothing else for the good of the order, then we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.